We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. My name is Rob H. And this week I am here with... Lee Overstreet, pinch hitter for AV Rant, filling in once again because Tom was only available for 10 minutes Tuesday at dawn. <laughs> <laughs> pretty pretty close to something like that. I mean, it's more like two hours, but yeah, uh, yeah. Our both of our schedules are packed right now, Tom and myself. As I as I teased last week, uh, yeah, both of us were not going to make it this week. So it turns out when Lee was available, I was available. So that's how we worked out to this. It's not that Tom is actually away uh, in, in any sense. It's just uh, for the time he was available, Lee wasn't available. So there we that's go. Right. Yeah, you got Lee and right. Rob today. I, unlike Tom and Rob, I just sit here staring at the computer waiting for them to call me. Yes, that's right. Just with bated breath, in stasis, waiting, for the, waiting right. for the AV rant call. To yeah, come I'm in a little cocoon type enclosure and my body temperature is kept very low until <laughs> they call me. Right. So I feel like it's been a while since we talked to Lee on the podcast. I can't even remember when when you were on. Like it wasn't like ages ago. No, but I think it was just a couple months ago. Wasn't is that it? is that what I don't know? Time has no meaning like... to me anymore. No, uh, but a- anything we should be catching up on you uh, on on with you, uh, Lee? Yeah. Not really. I could okay. talk about our little car accident, but eh. if you've been following him on Twitter, at least at his at Tesla Lusa account <laughs> yeah. on Twitter, then uh, then you would have known. Had a no. had a little fender better. Not your fault, right? You weren't oh, you God, weren't to blame no, for any no. of this. You got I you got hit in the rear end. Carefully, yeah, yeah, I would think so. A, a sixteen year old in a very large truck ah. just wasn't paying attention coming up mm-hmm. behind us mm-hmm. and thought we had already gone mm-hmm. and we mm-hmm. hadn't gone. Even and though you so, can take right. off like crazy from a standstill with all the torque in your electric vehicle. That's true. Vehicle. But my human reaction <laughs> is not as fast as the car. So by the time I saw headlights coming in the rearview mirror. Uh-huh. I and couldn't get the signal auto driving doesn't have like self preservation at all above all costs. That's uh, not programmed in there. Not from the rear. <laughs> not from the rear. From the front, yes, <laughs> actually, but not from the back. Yeah, they got to work <laughs> on that. There you go. All right. But uh, well, that's too bad. But uh, but that is eh, it runs. It that works. is a a a, a non sentient thing that can be repaired. So that, uh, all, all things exactly. considered, the that's health doing of the right. two humans in this household that's right. is great. We're, we're good right now. Uh, all of my parents are functioning at the moment, unless somebody nice. calls me this afternoon. So, <laughs> you know, there's been issues there. So yeah. eh, it's all right. It's okay. all right. All right. Well, we'll hope it continues on like that for a while. And uh, in the meantime, why don't we catch up a bit on uh, what we've watched and we haven't talked to Lee in a while. So what, what have you been watching on the old telly box there? Uh, just American Idol. That's all. <laughs> I haven't watched American Idol in ages. Well, look, nobody can laugh at me because Rob watches So You Think You Can Dance. Isn't that correct? When it's on, I don't I don't know on. if that's ever coming back. Yeah, um, I don't know if it's yeah, coming that, back. That, that, that's we all unlikely. have our little uh, guilty pleasures, and I guess there's no such thing as guilty pleasures. But listen, American Idol is an interesting study mm-hmm. in the evolution of picture and sound quality across broadcast. Uh, actually, yes, yeah. And yeah. then cable and then streaming. Because back in the day, when it was in its heyday in the late 2000s, uh, it, it wonderful broadcast quality, mm, 5.1 mm. surround sound. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, it was only 720p because it was ABC, if I'm remembering correctly. Fox or, back then, wasn't it? Was Fox wasn't back it Fox then, which back is also then? 720p, yeah. right? Yeah. So it was always 720p, but it looked great. Mm. And then we got cable, and it hung in there okay. <laughs> I think they kind of brought the quality down just a little bit. But then when we went to streaming on right. Hulu... Uh, there was this, I was weird for a while. We only had stereo. Mm-hmm. And then some of the scenes looked as though they only took one field from a 1080i camera. <laughs> that, I can't, that could be. It's chunky, not out of the question. Yeah, it was like chunky, non-aliased graphics right. and stuff, and it just didn't look right. And then I think a, a year or two ago, the audio kept going back and forth between surround and stereo oh, while lovely. I was watching it. Perfect. Just what and you want. So, now we're on paid Hulu and the picture quality is phenomenal. Every now and then it drops to blurry for some mm. reason, whereas nothing else in my house <laughs> drops bit rate. Just that. And the 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 sound has, has at least gotten consistent. I don't know if it's true surround mm. or if they're just putting the two channels to the left, right in a surround 
uh, doing a bit of an up mix or a left total right total yeah i think a left total right total no, and then no, no. i'm trying to like decode it anyway yeah uh so it, it's very <laughs> close to correct and it's just interesting to me how we and this is true for way more than american idol how we went from like really good hd when hardly anybody had it yeah right and to to now if you're watching on broadcast there's all those repacked channels and everybody's That's sharing right. transmitters and bit rate and so if i watch for instance american idol on uh recorded youtube tv they just record mm-hmm. the actual over the air broadcast yeah it looks like poop oh like huh. it is blur it may as well be a dvd right like, it just does not <laughs> i look don't good. think american idol has the budget that they used to anymore oh no either, no so. now yeah. to be fair they have amazing picture quality and sound quality mm-hmm. if you can get it okay from, from <laughs> it, the it exists at the source somewhere it's just all <laughs> yeah. our various distribution methods but at these least, days uh, Hulu pre-recorded uh, mm-hmm. uh, is is getting there. Okay, and, and I I'd love to hear anybody else's experience with anything that's broadcast mm-hmm. that has gone through this transition from mm-hmm. broadcast. You'll just have to, to put up an antenna and get it that way because that'll probably be nice. No, and clear. that'll be worse because they've repacked Shouldn't everything. Be. No, not on the, the actual it, broadcast, is it? Yeah, the actual over-the-air broadcast. Yeah. is lower quality than it used to oh, be. Oh no! Because all these transmitters, a lot of them are now sharing space yeah. in the in the bit rate. The multi-stream thing, right? All their yes. channels on the same. And like sometimes uh, completely yeah. unrelated channels, they'll yeah. be like a Fox yeah. and an NBC. <laughs> you know, Good grief! On, yeah, <laughs> and so uh, broadcast has gotten a lot worse, and the ATSC 3.0 hasn't. Uh, really no, because they're having so. to share that with ATSC 1.0 bandwidth at the, at this yeah. time. They're not allowed to turn that off. So, well, we we, we should move along. But I just just real quick, who's judging these days on American Idol? I have no idea who the judges are anymore. Oh, it's still Luke Bryan and Lionel Richie and Katy Perry. What do you mean still? I had no idea those were the three judges. <laughs> <laughs> There's no more Simon for... Cowell. He was the only one I remember. Oh God, no! He's no more Paul Clifford. Abdul. I would assume. Oh no, man, that's like the olden times. <laughs> it sure would be. Okay, still, still, those people I had no idea were doing. You had no Fantastic. idea. Fantastic. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I, I did not watch much this week, but I, <laughs> I dipped in and I watched the movie version from 2015 of Gem and the Holograms. Oh. Now I remember Gem as a cartoon from the 80s. Uh, I was, I was about the right age to be watching that as a young kid um so yeah i I remember i have have, like no real recollection of any of the story of the original gem cartoon but just you know kind of enjoyed some of the songs i vaguely recommend so i I went back just to watch like the pilot once again just to remind after i watched this movie version just to remind myself of any of the story and doing that i was like gem was like the perfect thing to update now that there is no reason you couldn't have taken like basically the same kind of plot line and done a really compelling version of it today, whether you went a little bit more humorous, a little bit more satirical with it, or actually just went pretty darn genuine straightforward and made it into, you know, like, like, uh, the gem, the, the main character, she ends up inheriting half of, of a record company from her father who dies in in the cartoon like it wasn't all like happy happy and like the whole thing was that the the other guy who used to be running the company when the father was still alive he gets the other half so like that's the rivalry so like there's a whole story baked in there and like why she has to use holograms and the uh the the synergy program that her father left behind and like you know the holograms come out of her earrings i'm like oh yeah i kind of vaguely remember all this stuff now and i'm like there's so much you could do with that in a in a live action version doing it now with today's effects that you could apply and everything like that y- you know how you didn't know anything about american idol yes just now. that's right <laughs> You could be making all of this up. I wouldn't have a clue. <laughs> no, I wouldn't have come up with all of that. And you can check on Wikipedia if you don't want to watch the pilot, which is like on Tubi. You can watch the old ah. the old gem uh, cartoon on Tubi, which is there's a lot of fun house. old stuff on Tubi. That's right. To Tubi's great. I really like yeah. Tubi. Uh, but uh, yeah, this 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 live action version does none of it. Nothing. I mean, they take the names. Uh-huh. And uh, th- they take some of the like you know classic lines out of the theme song and have characters say those things, but they go earnest with it. This is not humorous or satirical at all. They aren't like doing the fun thing that Josie and the Pussycats did, which was like just just you know hang a lampshade on everything and say it straight into the camera and have a blast with it, right? Josie and the Pussycats. I loved that movie because it was so darn silly, and they knew what they were doing, and they were winking and nodding all the way. But this was like, it just played it straight ahead forward, tried to be really earnest with it. Now, there was a part of my mind going, is this movie trying to play like six-dimensional chess? Because 
they basically they, like they they did the obvious thing of oh, okay yes you know eventually the producer wants to take her solo so she's gonna have to break up with her band and then they find out about it and they have a fight but then they get back together but they did it <laughs> so fast and so stupid and even had one of the characters just at the end be like well that was weird uh that <laughs> it was like kind of obvious that like that was like a producer of the movie's note like well what if they did this cliched thing and they're like okay whatever we don't have time to fight about it we'll just put it in the movie with no explanation the entire thing like the entire arc of this movie takes place over as far as i could tell three days and I was like, again, are they playing six dimensional chess because there's all these like rabid fans and they've only seen one YouTube video of Jem ever. And they're like, but now she's their whole world. And I'm like, is this, but they're doing it really earnest. They're not, like, again, if it was done as a comedy, that would be hilarious. And it is kind of funny, but nothing about this movie is funny. So I'm like, were they actually trying to be earnest or were they, or were they, were they poking fun at anything? I don't think. They were thinking that far ahead. I think this movie had a $5 million budget, which I know it did because I looked it up, and they had no money and no time to do anything. There are no holograms in this movie. Where does Gem and the Holograms come from? So someone just said, get this done. <laughs> oh, it sure seems like. And it's like, yeah, it was bizarre. It was a bizarre movie. I can see why people who were fans, like actual genuine fans, the cartoon meant something to them hated this movie because it was not the least faithful. but at the same time it was like i don't know that it was actually a terrible movie but holy cow like tons of things did not work they they did not have the budget to get like they had a bunch of cameos but they used archival footage of like stars that were signed up with universal so like they could have Dwayne the Rock Johnson's show up but it was like archival footage of him talking about something else that they like twisted into making it sound like he was talking about Jem. <laughs> so this is more of just an exercise in creating something with a title. When That's people traveled crazy. around, they used footage that looked like someone had pointed their phone at Google Maps on a computer screen and that's how they showed people traveling around only Los Angeles. They didn't even really need Google Maps because it's not like they became a worldwide phenomenon. It was all located just in Los Angeles. There's bizarre things, which all of it sounds like it's much more entertaining than it was. But I, I did want to say, Aubrey Peoples uh, stars as Jem. I had no idea who they were, uh, and she uses they them pronouns. So uh, uh -huh. you know, so uh, apparently uh, they were on two and a half seasons I think of Nashville so I have never watched Nashville Nashville is a huge huge TV show really really popular Aubrey Peoples is a fantastic singer so that worked they had really good singers they, they the people they cast for all the band members were really good singers and that all seemed like a kind of a waste the songs were actually kind of good I didn't mind the songs at all they were a very pop song so just teen treat anthem. it as a movie with some good songs and yeah, a little watchable. bit, yeah. but but yeah, holy cow! Uh, yeah, it had nothing to do with Gem and the Holograms, and then like at the very end, they finally bring the Misfits in. I'm like, that was the whole point of the show. Was he had like rival bands? You could have done Battle of the Bands. Like the the thing writes itself. Just do the pilot. That's all you had to do. <laughs> anyway. You know what I think is wonderful is this is a, a home theater podcast, yes. and we just talked about American Idol and Gem and the Holograms. I had to. It, it, it gave me <laughs> thoughts and feelings watching this movie. Uh, but yes, Molly Ringwald's in it. Juliette Lewis is in it. So I don't know how they got them to sign this movie, but okay. there they were. Christopher Scott, who I know very well because I used to watch So You Think He Can Dance, like Lee let you know. Uh, right. Really well-known choreographer, excellent choreographer. I had no idea he had anything to do with this movie because the choreography did not stand out. The people they cast to be in the band, really good singers, not good dancers. <laughs> so like <laughs> that was that was a waste having that. That's band a get it done movie. That's <laughs> all that is. Holy smokes! So yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting thing if you want to check it out and uh, and kind of cringe your way through it. And, and there I you go. Yeah. The yeah. more somebody tells me something is terrible, I kind of want to go not, see how it terrible It wasn't quite that kind of terrible. Anyway, we're never getting a sequel to this thing, which is a shame because we're never going to see her go up against the, the Misfits and the Stingers, which would have been fun. But uh, but there we go. <laughs> 
if you insist. I still have no idea what you're talking about, and it's hilarious. Uh, shall we move on to listeners we of the week? We absolutely should. But before that, we'll let people know what the heck this podcast is, because you wouldn't have been able to guess from the first 15 minutes that we just talked about. Uh, this is AV Rant. We answer your home theater and AV questions. Most of this podcast is sure Q and do. A. Yes, that is mostly what we do. So if you want your questions answered, all you have to do is email them to us. The address is question at avrant.com. That is by far the best way to get in touch with us. You can, however, find us also on Facebook, facebook.com slash avrantpodcast, and YouTube, where you can watch this podcast, uh, youtube.com slash avrant. So those are the places to go. You can reach us individually. I am Rob at avrant.com. Tom is Tom at avrant.com. And Lee has his own email address. Now it's I, Lee at avrant.com. Hooray! Yes, I'm now Lee at avrant.com. I don't mind telling people to find me on Twitter uh, still, but yep. I'm Lee at avrant.com. And apparently that Lee at avrant.com address got several people excited i got emails from that's right listeners going yay you've got an email address <laughs> you finally it only did took it. 10 years that's what it is you got to hang in there there's no fast tracking around here Apparently so uh, <laughs> there it is all the ways to get in touch with us question at avrant.com is the main one so there we go with that let's get on to our listeners of the week am i doing that are you doing that i don't know i how think that works you anymore. tend to do I, listeners I tend to do, you, and then you start i pick it up from there tark talking around the news time yeah so listeners yeah. of the week people who support this podcast in some way one of those ways is financially if you'd like wow. to just give us some money so uh patreon.com slash av rant podcast is the place to sign up to do that we have 139 patrons over there right now so wow. thank you all very much for the financial support very nice of you uh you can also give a one-time donation if you'd like to through paypal or in fact through paypal you can sign up to give a recurring monthly donation as well if you'd like to if you want to sign up to do that come to our website which is, of course, avrant.com. And on the right-hand side of the desktop version, there is a uh, graphic there of a cup of coffee, and it says, Donate, uh, Support AV Rant. So that'll take you to PayPal if you'd like to do things that way. We also like to thank people who uh, do things other than just straight giving us donations. So David took the time to send a bunch of movie codes to us for us to check if that's the sort of thing that might work properly for, for somebody out there. Uh, we, we wouldn't go against the terms of service and, and, and redeem but, that type but, of thing ourselves. Movie codes? Movie codes, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that's right. Thank you, David. <laughs> And uh, yeah, we also get uh, people who send us notes of gratitude for just keeping the podcast going through whatever the heck is going on this week. And right now it's scheduling stuff that we're dealing with. But here it is, an episode of AV Rant still here for you to listen to. So we thank you very much for the notes of encouragement. Uh, this week we got notes from Andreas, Greg and Bob. So thank you all very much. And we've got some things going on in the news. We sure do. Let's crack into it. Mm -hmm. uh, RSL Speakers has announced a new subwoofer model, the $800 Speedwoofer 12S. As you can guess from the name, it's very fast. <laughs> uh, this is it's a new 12 inch driver model powered by a 500 watt rms 1550 watt peak class d amplifier but unlike their extremely popular 450 dollar speed woofer 10s mark ii which struck a great combination of affordability compact size 15 and a half inch cube and surprisingly good performance this new speed woofer 12s is clearly aimed at taking on the likes of svs's pb2000 pro which I have a couple of those, and Mono Price's Monolith M12V2 while undercutting those models on price. The Speedwoofer 12S is big, almost 23 inches tall, just over 22 inches deep and almost 19 inches wide. That is mm -hmm. a hoss. Yeah. <laughs> and weighs... 82 freedom unit pounds. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So when we were looking at the old uh, Speedwoofer 10S, now Mark II version, but uh, the cabinet had stayed the side. I mean, no, 15 and a half inch cube is not tiny, tiny, but compact, I would it's say. It's reasonable. You, can, fit you in... can get that past most uh, spouses. Yeah, that's right. You can fit it a lot of places where, where other gigantic subwoofers might not go. $450 was a very reasonable price. Uh, you know, true 25 hertz extension still has output down at 20 hertz. But this one now, the 12S, uh, more than just a big brother. It's, it's like a different category of subwoofer altogether if, 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 you know, I'm putting my opinion on it. So certainly can't call it compact or easy to move around anymore. Also, one thing that I would just criticize about its cabinet design is it's got some sharp corners and edges. I was you... about to say that. I looked at the photo of this thing, and if you have toddlers, you better get corner protectors. <laughs> yeah. If there's such a thing as a brutalist subwoofer, this right. must be it. 
<laughs> yeah, it looks like it's coming with some uh, fairly large rubber feet already attached on the bottom. So that should do a decent job of uh, damping any vibrations from the bottom of the subwoofer onto the floor. But yeah, that is a a, a very sharp edged and cornered uh, hard subwoofer. So yeah, a few more That's details right. to share with you. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, the, so by the way, 82 freedom unit pounds, 37 <laughs> of the exotic Colograms. So anyway, nice pronunciation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, pe what is it? Man? People do say something wrong. They say uh, kilometers. A yeah. lot of people say kilometers. We say and kilometers. So why don't you just say I kilograms? <laughs> no, kilograms. Just, it's a, kilometers. It's a pet pet peeve. That's how of it mine. goes? Advertisement. It's kilometers, not kilometers. Anyway, yeah, uh, either is acceptable. <laughs> I, I disagree. The enclosure <laughs> has a rear firing slot port and is made of thick three quarter inch MDF with a one inch thick front baffle, thick with two C's, mm -hmm. uh, and extensive internal bracing. So seriously, it's a serious subwoofer. The 12 inch driver is made of Kevlar reinforced paper in a die cast aluminum frame, and the amplifier is DSP controlled, offering four preset modes reference, music, movie, and boundary with reference mode claiming anechoic extension down to 16 hertz. Mm -hmm. So all of your whale friends can enjoy it down at the beach. <laughs> a simple included remote control lets you change DSP modes and volume level from your seat. And interestingly, RSL has included RCA outputs as well as RCA inputs with the ability to apply an adjustable high pass filter to the outputs. And speaker wire inputs are also present, making this one of the more flexible subwoofer options for use with a dedicated two-channel audio system that might not have any bass management. So for real, that's a lot of inputs and outputs for a subwoofer nowadays. It is, yeah. It's a little bit unusual. I'm glad because like SVS has those only on the SB1000 Pro as far as speaker level inputs go. Uh, so, you know, they said, yeah, they wanted, they wanted to have a model still in the lineup for if you did just need a speaker wire connection. They have something yeah. that they can sell you that does that. But having a subwoofer as capable as I would absolutely expect this Speedwoofer 12S to be, uh, that still gives you those connection options. I'm very glad that ex that exists out in the world. And uh, yeah, 800 bucks, not a bad deal at all. The type of extension and output that this is offering is definitely uh, comparable. I, I would compare it directly to the Monolith uh, M12 uh, V2. It's it's almost exactly the same size and almost exactly the same specs, but $100 cheaper. So really can't complain about that. Just don't bump your knees into it. For real, watch out for the corners. <laughs> Now that Dirac Live has been released for Denon and Marantz's newest AV receiver models, a firmware update has been issued and the online manuals have been updated. There have been a few interesting changes aside from the obvious addition of Dirac Live room correction. The online manual gets a new enhanced features March 2023 update section, which explains the new changes and additions. If you've been a Denon or Marantz user for a while now and have gotten used to their setup menu, there's a new menu structure to get used to with many of the previous settings options now hidden behind an advanced tab. Anytime I see advanced, that's the first place I go and just start right. screwing things up <laughs> straight to advanced. What's this? <laughs> As expected, information about Dirac Live room correction is now included in the online manual. Although most of the specifics about actually running the Dirac setup software are pawned off to Dirac themselves, rather than trying to cover everything in Denon or Marantz's own manual, it's made explicitly clear that you will need to provide your own USB microphone and that the included Odyssey microphone cannot be used to set up Dirac. The basics of what to expect when running the Dirac setup software are covered. So they're pretty much telling you, here's Dirac, you do whatever you want to with it. There you go. Off you <laughs> go on your own. That's it. <laughs> but perhaps the most uh, interesting and unexpected change is the new flexibility that's been added when it comes to your choice of overhead speakers. Uh, Dolby Atmos and Dolby Surround can now utilize the surround height speaker positions that come from the Oro 3D speaker setup. And Oro 3D can now utilize top front, top middle, and top rear speaker positions. So it's finally possible to use top middle speakers in place of the top surround voice of God speaker position while running Oro 3D. So that's it does make it easier. You know, I, I say this makes it easier because, for example, let's say you installed front heights, surround heights, and rear heights. Mm. In the past, you would only be able to use the front heights and rear heights when playing Atmos, mm. and then you would use the front heights and surround heights only when playing Oro. But now you can be like, no, I can use all six of those for Atmos, the surround heights now in place of my top middles. 
which completely makes sense because all that is is moving those speakers off of your ceiling onto the walls way up high to the right, sides. Right. So, you know, and then I we always said, I mean, wouldn't it just make sense if you have top middles to be able to use those as the voice of God channel instead of having to have an actual separate speaker <laughs> installed directly right. above you? Uh, you know, Mono Price's HTP1 pre-pro let you do that, but that was about the only device out there uh, besides a Trinov uh, processor that let you do that. So, yeah, glad to see those. Uh, I, I wasn't expecting that type of flexibility to be added, but I'm happy to see it. Uh, and then just back on that direct note uh one thing we were talking about is that the denim rances they just have two speaker preset memory slots inside uh of the av receiver and we were wondering oh you're only going to be able to store uh you know two runs of dirac or or two uh different settings for example you know dirac doesn't have curves of equal loudness so one thing that's nice to be able to do is set a couple of different target curves when it comes to how much the bass is rising so that if you're say listening at a lower volume level you can have a greater rise in the bass to perceptually keep keep it even uh, and then have one that's closer to a flatter line when you're listening at full reference volume. But what they did is by default, when you run to rack, it's going to get saved in speaker preset two. Uh, you can okay. manually change that if you want to, but by default, that's the way it works on the Denimarances. But then within the Dirac settings of the AV receiver, they give you three Dirac slots. So you have one speaker preset that stores Dirac, but within that preset, you get three Dirac slots for three different target curves that you make inside of the software. So right. you Nested do have settings. <laughs> you do have some ability to uh, to store multiple different target curves uh, with Dirac on the Denim Rancid. So that's go all good news. Some uh, LG OLED news. Uh, Vincent Teal from HDTV Test shared some happy news for 2023 LG OLED owners. In past model years, LG OLEDs included several auto-dimming scenarios aimed at reducing burn-in and image retention. Annoyingly, the image would dim if the average picture level remained the same for too long. Yeah, I, I saw that. Yeah. yeah. Or if a static element on screen remained in the same position for too long. This made perfect sense for very bright scenes or bright static logos. And for bright elements, you could adjust how aggressive the auto-dimming would be in the user menu. But... The auto dimming would happen during dim scenes, which is really strange. Yep, <laughs> but make it was dim there. dimmer. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't programmed right. Uh, there was no way to defeat it from the user menu. Uh, this could lead to dim scenes becoming completely unwatchable, or any game with a heads-up display looking extremely dark all the time. And the only way to fix the auto-dimming was to venture into the TV service menu to change a couple of settings that would void your warranty. Mm -hmm. Now, that's an advanced menu right there. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> when, when Vincent got an early hands-on test with the newest C3 and G3 models, he went into the service menu and discovered that those options were no longer present. <laughs> And the earliest units sold at retail stores still had the same auto dimming scenarios, but now there wasn't even a way to turn them off in the service menu if you wanted to void your warranty. Mm -hmm. But happily, LG has issued a firmware update, and now there are 23 OLEDs no longer auto dim during dim scenes. And that's just the default now. No more service menu settings necessary. Auto dimming for bright scenes is still present, and you still have the user menu controls to adjust how aggressive that is. The only time I've run across it uh, is just like CNN. Sure. And there'd be times. That's probably the like, logo detection. Yeah. There have been times, you know, during some long story coverage that I'm watching, I'm like, am I falling asleep? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you switch it off and back to CNN That's and right. all of a sudden it blows your eyeballs That's out. That's right. So yeah. I turned down the uh, auto dimming. To, I had it mm -hmm. on high because I was being very paranoid and protective in the early days of the OLED. But and even now, if you did, you would still get dimming that you would have to venture into the service menu to turn yeah. off, which is not easily accessible. You either have to get a specialized remote or know the commands to program into your Harmony, say, and uh, do, do some remote commands to get into the service menu to begin with. So, I mean, you weren't meant to go in there and right, changing right. any settings in there voids your warranty. So, uh, you know, we're taking a risk. So I'm very glad on the 2023s, you don't have to think about that anymore. Just make sure your firmware is up to date and you shouldn't have the very annoying one, which is dim scenes dimming even more when they really don't need to that was I wonder just if i have seen error. that and didn't realize it probably mayhaps yeah. well nowadays i'm well past any warranty i can go screwing around right in any <laughs> menu i want to that's right so i might i might look that one up mm -hmm. uh <clears throat> all right the first roku device that supported 4k resolution output was the roku 4 
that launched near the end of 2015. It's been that long? It is. Wow. Roku's ending support for that device, which, uh, and it will no longer receive any further software or app updates. Critical security updates will still be issued as necessary. Uh, you can continue using the Roku for if you have one, but Roku warns that some apps might stop working and there won't be any updates coming to fix them, nor any new apps updated, uh, added. Uh, if you registered your Roku 4, you should have received an email with a discount offer to upgrade to a new Roku device. How about that? It's almost <laughs> like they want you to buy another Roku. Yeah, and the discount was anywhere between 20 to 40%. I'm, I'm guessing based on how long you've had it or or what territory you're in, I'm sure would make a difference. So yeah, just kind of, I mean, you know, 2015, yeah, that's... I mean, it's not eight years yet because it came out, you know, end of 2015. Mm -hmm. So we're talking, you know, seven years and some months right. to just be like, well, that 4K device just, that, that's gonna it. Be, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's going to be slow, uh, no doubt. Yeah. And I don't mind, I don't mind when something that changes so quickly like computer technology yeah. uh, gets, gets a little bit left behind. As long as you let me keep using something in an outdated fashion if I, I suppose. want to. That you know, seems if, a little bit quick to me. Seven years seems a little bit quick for a device to be like, no, no further updates. I mean, they weren't tremendously expensive, but like the Roku 4, it, you know, it got it got replaced by the Roku Ultra. That's what took its place in the lineup. That's a $100 device. So it wasn't like one of the $25 Rokus where you're kind of like, okay, whatever. <laughs> it's right, like, right. you know, that was a $100 <laughs> device. It was only seven years ago. So I, I think that's pushing it a little bit. But it, it feels like it. But in my mind nowadays, I just see it as, there are uh, fast moving live online devices. Yeah. And don't expect those to be supported for very long. Don't spend too much on them. I guess so. And, you know, you're just going to constantly pay for things when you're connected. And yeah. then there's devices like the TV itself, even mm -hmm. though it is connected, but, you know, speakers and amplifiers and TVs and stuff like that that are. Uh, uh, not they're they're connected, but they're more permanent devices. Yeah. That's how I see it in my mind, and so, eh, you know, I kind of expect this sort of thing. But I'm with you. That doesn't seem yeah very very long. But ten years least, plus, I think. I think ten years should be like the minimum cutoff. At least they don't shut it off. I like uh, ah, I got yeah. I got shut off on an older version of some Adobe software. Right. They just said no, not yeah. anymore. No, yeah. turned it right off, and I'm like, well, okay, what do I do now? Indeed. So uh, moving on to some comments before mm -hmm. we get to questions, comments from uh, various listeners. Andreas says he works for Cisco, so he's pretty darn familiar with computer networking and how it functions. He came across, oh, this is so good, the iFi Audio LAN Eye Silencer. Mm -hmm. That's right, the iFi Eye Silencer. That's it. Which is supposed to, quote unquote, quiet your network. So that your precious network audio signals won't have to suffer interference or ground potential differences. Uh, it's a $100, kind of like that old Roku, three-inch yeah. long dongle that they suggest plugging into your router or switch. As a networking professional, he thought it was the funniest thing he's ever seen, and I think he's right. I, You know what? At this point, more power to him. If you can convince people to spend $100 uh. on a doohickey... I, just, I you know cannot what? get on board with that no. kind of thinking. Go, I, what the heck? Who cares anymore? Nope, I'm so sick I, of it. If you're dumb enough to buy that, <laughs> I've said before, I'm really not much of a capitalist, and that is certainly one of the areas <laughs> where I am not okay with capitalism running amok and no, look, doing I that don't type like of thing. taking advantage of people, and yeah, so that is... things that take advantage of folks who are poorer or like seniors, disabled people, right. anyone you know that that is in a disadvantaged position in life, I get mad. But if you're you're stupid and rich, <laughs> and you want to spend a hundred dollars on a doohickey? Knock <sighs> your socks off! I don't care anymore. That just is brutal. Our, listen to us, and you'll save hundreds here and there. Sure, yeah. I just love or, what they talk about as though, as though audio signals through an Ethernet connection mm -hmm. are are somehow some kind of totally separate special signal that yeah, sure. You know sure. the 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 noise on your network normally fine for your lowly computer internet signals we don't care about those but audio signals you know right. those low frequency <laughs> signals right. just so special so very very special Look, this is taking advantage let's be honest of old guys <laughs> who started in analog audio uh -huh. and I, I say that as kind of an old guy and they have plenty of money and they like to be right 
and they like to but hear things is, other people can't hear. this is very, very wrong. <laughs> they, they like to hear things other people can't hear sure. and then fix those problems that you can't yeah. hear, and that makes them better than you. So you know what? Knock your socks off. Buy the $100 thing. Don't well, care anymore. I say don't. That's fine. <laughs> you can take Lee's advice or mine, but mine is right, and, and this, <laughs> this type right. of thing should go away. <laughs> Well, it, it works, but only if Mercury is in retrograde and you sure, burn sure. some sage. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm going to move on from that mm-hmm. one. <laughs> that one is just making me mad. But it is AV rant, so... It is, yes. That's kind of the whole point. Uh, Joe has comments. He wanted to share the results from his latest job at an assisted living residence. Now, this is the opposite of taking advantage of seniors. Indeed. This is great. He was tasked with designing, purchasing, installing, and calibrating all of the theater items for the residents who will use the room as a common area, and he put a whole bunch of AV rant advice to good use. So Joe put together a home theater at an assisted living residence, and it's pretty. It looks great. This Uh, room looks really nice. It's really clean, but still very inviting, and all of the things that have to do with actual performance, I mean, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the acoustic treatments that he's put in here and the seating and everything. Like, yeah. everything that's put in here, I think, looks terrific. I can't imagine anybody walking into this room, like, does this look like something other than a theater that you're walking into? I would say, no, you're going to recognize oh, that you're walking into... Oh, it's immediately a theater. Yes. But it, like, it really has a very comfortable, and I say, like, everything that's been put in here enhances... The feeling, uh, you know, I, I, my first comment back to him was like, you know, who says acoustic treatments have to be an eyesore? Like, to me, this absolutely enhances everything about the looks, uh, far from detracting from it. But yeah, well, I'll let as you I read go some with some more of the details. Here about yeah. the uh, details, you'll, you'll see how it is both lovely, appropriate, and very AV rantish. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. The interior decorator they worked with was open to using neutral gray coloring for the walls and seating. Excellent. And thanks to the cool Art Deco looks of Gick's Impression Pro combo panels, he was able to display acoustic panel treatments on the walls. And yeah, man, Art Deco and the I think those are sconces that look very Art Deco yep, as well. Yep. And, you know, also older folks, <laughs> might relate that to high quality theater. Uh, <laughs> the display is an Epson 3800 projector firing onto a 120 inch acoustically transparent silver ticket screen. And the sound system is a 7.2 configuration powered by the good old Denon X3700H driving shoe in wall speakers and a pair of SVS SB1000 Pro subs that easily hide in the rear corners of the room, so nobody's going to hit their knee on a corner. Nope, they sure won't (laughs) on his one. (laughs) Uh, All cables and wiring came from Monoprice. Power protection is from APC, and a Harmony Elite provides control. I mean, if that's not an AV rant system. It sure sounds like one, doesn't it? (laughs) All the purchases came in for a total under $9,000, which made the clients very happy, and it looks and sounds great. Ah, Man, I love success in home theater. Uh, Rob specifically requested Joe's thoughts on the shoe in wall speaker. So he's happy to report that their high efficiency lives up to their specs and billing. They were easy to calibrate. And the Denon has no trouble at all powering them from behind the acoustically transparent screen with lots of dynamics and headroom. He did end up boosting the center channel since this is an assisted living residence and the goal was to keep dialogue clear and easy to hear, which was achieved. So he's just nailing it on all fronts. I'd it's, say so. It yes. sounds like that. I mean, just talk about designing something appropriate for the situation. That's the key. If you're helping someone with audio video or computer or any other mm-hmm. technology is not just getting the very best thing possible or what you like. It's what's exactly right for that situation. And boy, he nailed it. Oh, I'd say so. Yeah. I, I mean, I would be thrilled to have this available to me to use. And yeah, I just, I love the looks of this. And I mean, right. none of it is like over designed, you know, like overly complicated or looks like, you know, something you, you, like, it looks so good for how much was spent on this, and really? I'm, yeah. I'm I'm certain the performance in the audio is is well above what anybody expected there. So, fantastic! Congratulations! Yeah. I'm super happy we played any part in that because I'm very proud to to be able to say we had any any part in, in uh, achieving that result. And wonderful. Yeah. And Thank if I should sharing. ever need, if I ever need an assisted living facility one day, a, yeah, it better have a theater like that. <laughs> That's what everybody deserves. For sure. All right, moving on to Jim. Jim, regarding the audibility of any change to the sound of in-wall speakers within your theater, depending on whether you use a backer box or not, 
Jim wanted to emphasize that you can calculate what the frequency response will be using the free WinISD software that many DIY speaker makers rely upon to help with designing their builds. You can choose a woofer that matches whatever is being used in your in-wall speaker and then change the cubic footage on the cabinet to calculate the frequency response and output. Doing so indicates that above a normal 80 hertz or 90 hertz crossover frequency, there's really no impact on the speaker's sound. Th this reminds me of the good old days of designing subwoofer boxes in people's trunks. Yep. Like a close friend of mine had a, built his own in a, in a Camaro. <laughs> yep. The good old days. Yeah, it's and that's exactly, exactly the same the idea. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly the calculations you do. So then, of so, course, yeah, it is, uh, you know, the teal smalls parameters as far as the uh, drivers go, uh, basing that. So, yes, of course, this is calculation. This is simulation. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to have some anomalous results in the real world oh, <laughs> if yeah. you, you know, build something and it comes out a little bit different? Of course it is. But but based on all of the calculable uh, parameters, yeah, this gives you a good idea. And, yeah, we, we had no disagreement. It is in the base that you're going to uh, have a difference in terms of what the cabinet behind the driver uh, actually changes in terms of the sound. Uh, there we go. So he just so, he just wanted to highlight. He wanted to make sure people were aware of that Win ISD software and, and being able to view the graphs for yourself and uh, put in the parameters for yourself if you if you're not convinced by what has been said. There we go. Uh, Bob in the Philippines wanted to share his warning in case it helps someone else out there. He recently got the newest Apple TV 4K after being an NVIDIA Shield user for many years. He was getting sparkles on screen no matter what settings he changed, even if, if he wasn't watching Jim. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the not enough sparkles in that Jim movie. Sparkles not enough. nearly enough sparkles. No, man. That's a C- minus on sparkles. Uh, <laughs> he was annoyed by Apple's setup procedure, and buying Apple products in the Philippines is a much less convenient process than we're used to in the U.S. and Canada. He was certain... His HDMI cable was good. It was from Blue Jeans and had been working flawlessly this whole time. He was about ready to chuck his new Apple TV 4K into the street to watch some cars run over it. <laughs> That'll make some sparkles, some sparks <laughs> yeah. anyway. But just before doing that, he decided to open a brand new identical Blue Jeans HDMI cable and voila, no more sparkles. And the Apple TV 4K <laughs> works just fine. So never assume. Unless it's assuming that HDMI cables are probably to blame, <laughs> even when you're positive, you're using a known good cable. And w didn't I just tell you before we started today, Rob, that I had yes. a known XLR mic cable right. that was good, yeah. and I just moved it and a hum went away. There you go, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm telling you, don't assume. Always run the experiment, get another cable. Yeah. Yeah, ha I guess, you know, having that box of spare HDMI cables that so many of us have, uh, yeah. it's never a bad idea to swap out the cable. Uh, one thing I do like on uh, on the Denon Amaranth AV receivers, they don't really tout it. It's not in the manual, uh, but you can look up the instructions for uh, for how to access it. They actually have an HDMI cable tester uh, that that's built into, uh, let's see, at least last year's and this year's uh, Denon Amaranth AV receiver models, where you actually will take an HDMI cable plug one end of that cable into the you know 4k hdmi 2.1 or 8k hdmi 2.1 input and the other end of that same cable into the receiver's own output so both okay. ends of the hdmi cable are plugged into the same receiver ah, cool. one into an input one into an output and then you can actually run an hdmi cable test it'll tell you how much bandwidth uh it can go through that cable successfully so that's a, a handy little test feature that can be that's done that's actually pretty fantastic yeah 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 i don't know why they don't tout it more they talked about it a little bit when they they first added that feature like in some youtube videos but they it's not even in the manual it's a weird thing so rob given that this is a podcast where we answer people's av and home theater questions do you oh, think it? we should maybe set aside i say about half the show for some questions let's yeah, let's shall <laughs> let's uh let's get into the questions we had a bunch left over from last week so we're playing some catch up all right i will uh Maybe I'll up the pace of my reading. I don't know. I'll oh, go to we'll, 1.25 we'll times. That's right. <laughs> Julian has a question. Julian's TV is a Samsung Q9FN. It can do HDR10+, plus, but it's old enough that it only has an HDMI ARC connection, not eARC. Mm -hmm. His receiver is a Yamaha RX A3070. It has eARC, but it cannot pass through HDR10+, plus, even <laughs> though it will pass through HDR10 and Toby Vision just fine. Yeah. He's got an Apple TV 4K, which recently got an update to support HDR10+. And he's got a 7.2.2 speaker configuration using front height speakers as his only overhead speakers. 
He tried plugging his Apple TV 4K directly into a Samsung TV and confirmed he was getting HDR10+. But with the audio being sent from his Samsung TV to his Yamaha receiver via regular HDMI arc, he wasn't getting Atmos audio anymore. Mm -hmm. And of course, when he plugged his Apple TV 4K into his Yamaha receiver, he got Atmos audio back, but only HDR10 video being sent to his TV. So no more HDR10+. Yeah. This is what happens when you chase the, the cutting edge. <laughs> so in his case, do we think he should give up Atmos or give up HDR10+. Plus? Would he not be missing much with one or the other? Or should he use some sort of HDMI audio extractor so that he can have both things at once? Wow. Okay. Yeah. That, <laughs> that's a good question. Where's your priority? What, what do you value more? Uh -huh. I, I lean toward the HDR. I'd value that more than Atmos. Really? Plus. You'd rather have HDR10 I mean, plus? I don't know. Than I just Atmos don't, audio. Because I don't care about Atmos. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I have a definitive answer, which is I don't care about HDR10 plus there you at go. all. all right, now, I mean, sure. if it, if this were a case where you were losing all forms of HDR oh, video, that, yeah, that you that'd had be the no end of the world. HDR whatsoever, I would feel differently. But HDR10 plus to me versus you can still have HDR10. All right. So what I'm saying to do is plug your Apple TV 4K into your Yamaha receiver. Mm -hmm. that, that you're obviously going to have Atmos audio with the uh, Apple TV 4K plugged directly into the AV receiver, and right. then that AV receiver will send through HDR10. It won't send HDR10 right, right. plus, but it will send HDR10. And to me, that is definitely a case of you're not missing much. <laughs> you're not missing right. really anything, what in my is opinion. That plus, I do not recall. So HDR10 plus is. Samsung's rival thing to Dolby Vision, which is that it does have uh, dynamic okay. metadata. All right, dynamic. it has gotcha. not not necessarily frame by frame, but changing metadata. With HDR10, there is a single piece of metadata that gets sent at the beginning of the movie or TV show, and then what they refer to as static metadata. It doesn't change throughout the program. Whereas both Dolby Vision and HDR10 Plus, they can update the HDR metadata throughout the movie as it's playing, mm -hmm. so that if you have a very dim scene, you can tone map that so that you're using a greater portion of the display's range mm -hmm. versus a very bright scene they'll say, okay, we need to tone map that down so we're not clipping off a bunch of highlights, but you right. don't have to use the same tone map for both the dim scene and the bright scene. You can have two different tone maps going on. You're able to change that on the fly with either Dolby Vision or HDR10+. But two things going on here. One, HDR10+, even though it's possible for it to be manually encoded the way Dolby Vision is. By and large, what you're seeing with HDR10 Plus was all auto-generated metadata anyway. So they would just threw it through an algorithm that said, okay, I think we'll tone map it this way on this scene and tone map it this way on this other scene. But there's really no guarantee that there was honestly very much oversight of that dynamic uh, metadata tone mapping whatsoever. And second of all, your Q9FN is already a very bright display well over a thousand nits peak, which means for the vast majority of content, it doesn't even need to do any tone mapping. It can literally just show you the signal, exactly the number of nits that the signal said to show mm. in the mm. HDR10 signal. So I'm saying you really are not missing much by giving up HDR10 plus and definitely keep the Atmos part of it and no need to spend any extra on some kind of, uh, I mean, this would have to be like an HD Fury that can actually do you know, that level of, of audio extraction properly while retaining HDR10 plus being sent through. So right. don't bother spending the money on that. Yep. Just plug it into the AV receiver. With that additional info, I agree 100%. <laughs> He's also got an Xbox Series X, but his current TV tops out at 4K60. It cannot do 4K 120 or VRR. Mm -hmm. So he was thinking he might upgrade his TV at some point in the not too distant future, probably to an OLED. Would he also need to get a new AV receiver one that can handle HDMI 2.1. He's ready to spend some money, isn't he? Well, I mean, you know, the TV upgrade, if you're going to get everything that an Xbox Series X can offer you, then, yep, yeah. the only way to do it is a new TV in his case. Mm -hmm. Happily, you would not need to get a new AV receiver because that new OLED that you're looking at, if it can do 4K 120 and VRR, it will be able to have an eARC HDMI output, which means that full lossless audio can go. So you would plug the Xbox Series X directly into your new OLED. That one you would not plug into your Yamaha. You'd plug that straight into the new OLED and then through eARC, the enhanced audio return channel, the audio can all be sent to your Yamaha, which 
we know has an eARC port. Mm -hmm. So happily, you don't need a new AV receiver. I will give you one warning though. I would most likely point you towards an LG OLED because those have all the green check marks for your Xbox Series X, including <laughs> be a, being able to do Dolby Vision with variable refresh rate at 4K 120, which nothing besides Sony's brand newest Quantum Dot OLEDs uh, are able to do the new A. 95L. Yeah, I had to remember that model name, but those are the only displays other than LGs. Rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? No other Sonys, no Samsungs, only the A95 LQD OLED from Sony is the only other display that can do all the green check marks on an Xbox Series X. So I would point you towards an LG OLED. And this is a case where, since you'll be feeding all of the audio directly through the TV and then relying on eARC, and the Xbox Series X is a perfectly capable disc player if you want to use it for playing back Blu-rays and Ultra HD Blu-rays, one of the things to be aware of is the newest, so this would be like the C3 or the G3 for now that we're in 2023, mm -hmm. they can pass through all forms of audio. For the past three years, so this would be like the CX, the C1, and the C2, or the GX, the G1, and the G2, the mm -hmm. past three model years, mm -hmm. DTS audio wouldn't go through those TVs. If you went all the way back to like the C9 in 2019, mm -hmm. they did all the audio formats, but they took it away for three years. For 2020, 2021, and 2022, they dropped DTS entirely. You couldn't even send a vanilla 5.1 DTS signal through an LG OLED TV for those did three Did they have some years. sort of melodramatic falling out with DTS? I don't know what, what? I mean, it's, you know, uh, the chip they were using just didn't handle DTS audio whatsoever. But now that we're into 2023, the C3 model, the G3 model, they get the ability to pass DTS audio through them again. So it would be worth it if you're using your Xbox Series X as a movie disc player, since there are a lot of movies encoded with DTS audio. That's going to be where you go, okay, look at the look at the attractive prices on the C2 models now that they're on clearance. It's like, uh, just be aware they, they won't pass through DTS audio. Hmm. All right. Well, I never hesitate to tell someone to go buy a brand new LG OLED. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's always my first. Unless somebody doesn't understand what I mean when I say static images, mm -hmm. unless I know somebody leaves it on cable news 24 7, uh, I just tell everybody to get the OLED if they can. Yeah. That's always my first choice. Uh, Nathan has some questions from last time. Uh, yes, it's an old console now, but Nathan just recently picked up an Xbox One S. One got, S, not one, Series S, One uh, S. Yeah. Xbox One S. He's got it plugged into an LG B7 OLED with a Sonos Play Bar attached for audio. Can we point to a settings guide for his Xbox One S console? And on the audio side of things, since the only way to connect the Sonos Play Bar is with an optical audio connection, should he just set the Xbox One S to output Dolby Digital 5.1 only? Hmm, that's actual very good questions. Yeah, <laughs> I'll do the last one first on the audio side of things. Yeah. You've got it exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, the Sonos Play Bar has optical audio in only. It has no other audio connections, right. but it is a three channel, like an actual three channel sound bar. It has left, center, and right. Mm -hmm. So you do want to feed it uh, a Dolby Digital 5.1 signal. I mean, of course it can take just a stereo signal right. and, and do a little you know center channel derivation out of that. Uh, but if you feed it just a regular Dolby Digital 5.1 signal, it will decode that properly and play all of the sounds and give you a discrete center channel out of that Sonos play bar. So Perfect. I absolutely think that's the way to do things. Keeps it very simple, very easy to handle. So Dolby Digital 5.1. And even the Xbox doesn't tend to screw that up too much when that's all it's sending out of, uh, of its audio. Port. So that part's very good. As far as the video settings, uh, I'll point you over to our great friend Vincent Tio at HDTV Test. Uh, he's got a video on YouTube on exactly how you should set up your Xbox One. And just in short, you basically want to go into the advanced part of the video setup menu. Advanced and, menu, yay! <laughs> and check every box other than 3D. All right, so your B7 OLED doesn't do 3D. It won't even give you the option that'll actually be grayed out, but you know, you won't have a check mark next to 3D, but everything else, you want the check mark there. And by default, it doesn't have a check mark next to everything. The main one being allow 422 output. Uh, Vincent does a fantastic in-depth job of explaining why you do want a check mark there. And honestly, 
it's primarily for, again, if you're using your Xbox One S as a Blu-ray or Ultra HD Blu-ray player, that's the main reason you want to have that 422 check. But it does no harm to your games. And if you ever do put a movie disc in there, you might as well have it checked ahead of time right. so that the Xbox doesn't do some of the weirdness it does where it converts things to RGB and then converts it back and whatever. It's all explained in depth, but every check mark except 3D and that's about all you really need to know. Perfecto. Uh, Dan has a question. In CE Pro, they publish a section called HDMI Corner by DPL Labs. Dan read there about a problem when it comes to so-called 8K, 10K, 48G HDMI cables. Yes. That's, yeah, we, we need 10K. Something about a clocking issue that arises if you use those cables along with an HDMI extender. They mentioned how in the past it was always the recommendation to use as short an HDMI cable as possible to connect an HDMI extender to the devices on the other end, on either end. Mm -hmm. But now they're saying with these much higher bandwidth HDMI cables, you actually need to use a longer HDMI cable on either end of the HDMI extender in order to avoid these clocking issues, quote unquote. <laughs> Have we heard anything about this? Why is HDMI so problematic and what $100 dongle will solve this? Right, yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, he, he, he gave me the name of the article that he was referencing, yeah. uh, but didn't provide a link. And I think the reason he didn't provide a link is because I went searching for it and I couldn't find this exact article. I did find, you know, HDMI corner by DPL labs in CE pro, but this exact article I couldn't find. Oh, I don't know if that's because it's only available through their subscriber newsletter or it's still behind a paywall and will become available in the future. I don't subscribe to CE Pro, so right. maybe it's just behind a paywall for the current month or something like that. Um, but anyway, I, I couldn't find exactly what it was. So I was kind of relying on what Dan said about it, uh, you know, to put this together. So this exact thing that he's talking about, I am not familiar with. I, I, I'm not sure exactly why, but... What I do know is like predominantly in CE Pro, when they're talking about HDMI extenders, they're talking about HD base T, uh, which is converting the HDMI signal to an Ethernet connection. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why you would have, you know, a thing that converts the HDMI signal on the source end to Ethernet. Then you pass the long signal through an Ethernet cable, and then you have another converter on the other end that converts it back to HDMI to connect to your display. HD base T doesn't support HDMI 2.1 yet. Uh, it's still back on HDMI 2.0. So I could see how if they're trying to do conversions from HDMI 2.1 sources into an HD base T extender, how maybe they're running into <laughs> some issues in terms of converting uh, the signals and bandwidth. Maybe some of the EDID information is getting confused. I, I, I could easily see how a thing like that could be the case when you're okay. essentially trying to take, you know, a higher bandwidth signal than what the HD base T extender can handle uh, and just making sure that all of those signals still work properly. Because, of course, you know, these are big installations where people are not ever going to be okay with the thing not functioning properly. Right. Um, now, the idea that, like, if you were just talking about a, you know, a very short passive HDMI cable that can handle 48 gigabits per second, you plug that into an HD base T extender and somehow just using a six foot one or a 10 foot one is going to make any difference no that that wouldn't make any difference uh if what they are actually talking about though again i was just relying on dan's dan's sort of you know summary of what was said if, if what they were saying was if you want to do 8k or 10k through a 48 gigabit per second connection what you need to do is switch to a fiber optic HDMI cable, a very long HDMI cable, rather than relying on an HD base T Ethernet extender. That right. would totally make sense because, sure, like I say, sure. HD base T so far, they don't have an HDMI 2.1 solution just yet. Um, I've seen some commercial workarounds where they basically use like four ethernet connections to mm, like okay. divvy yeah. up the signal and get all the bandwidth to you that way of it's course time to they're... go fiber optic if you're yeah, up at yeah. 8k and 10k but so, yeah when i see something that that says clocking issue it sounds a right lot like uh it's gonna sell me a dongle right um, so i don't i don't know so i'm not Totally, I don't know exactly yeah. what was said in that article, not having been able to read it for myself. So, but if if what they were talking about was okay, if we're going into HDMI 2.1, 40 or 48 gigabits per second, that 
what you need to do is start transitioning to fiber optic HDMI cables, that would totally make sense because there absolutely can be conflicts if you're trying to send an HDMI 2.1 signal through the HD base T Ethernet extender that might have already been installed, right? Maybe you were already at that location. That's what you installed for them before. You're going to have to explain to your client, if you want everything to be HDMI 2.1, I'm going to have to replace all that with some fiber optic cables. Right. It's the only way. I, I bet it's not that sophisticated. I still think this is going to be a dongle. <laughs> it's like clocking. It's timing. There's interference. <laughs> it's and more Merc like you know, retrograde again. just making sure bandwidth and EDID is working correctly, right. which, which is very problematic. Yes. Definitely. Uh, he has more questions. Mm -hmm. We seem to often say that most people really do not need external amplification. <laughs> he gets that it has to do with room size, seating distance, and something to do with speaker ohms and DB sensitivity. Yeah, yep. you're right. <laughs> but could we dive a bit deeper into all of that? In short, how do you determine the correct amount of amplifier power that you need? And I think he was getting there. Uh, mm -hmm. Depending on the speakers you want to use and the size of the room, your goal is that reference volume. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear what the director meant for you to hear? That's right. What the signal is asking for out of your mm -hmm. system. So uh, where you would start most easily, like if, if you just want to do the arithmetic, right, and figure out, okay, given what speakers I have, the distance I'm sitting from those speakers, how much amplifier power do I need to hit mm -hmm. full reference volume? So we'll start at, okay, we need to know reference volume is sustained output at 85 decibels. We need to be able to achieve that at the seat at the primary seat, sustained output of 85 decibels and peaks as high as 105 decibels. And we are talking about speakers here. We're going to assume that your subwoofers have their own power and amplification built into them. Right. So for speakers, 85 decibels sustained, 105 decibel peaks. So we know those numbers is what we're aiming for at the seat. We can then look at the sensitivity, the efficiency rating of the speaker. And that's going to be something like 86 or 87 typically decibels per one watt per one meter. That's a pretty typical sensitivity. And of course, it could be something different. It could be more efficient. It could be 92 dB per one watt per one meter, mm -hmm. or it could be 82 dB per one watt per one meter. Yikes. Now, the one watt part of it uh, also depends on what the nominal impedance of the speaker is. So when they say one watt, one meter, that would be in reference to an eight ohm speaker. If it were a four ohm speaker, which of course many speakers are, what you would end up with is um, sometimes you'll see it rated at instead of one watt, they'll say 2.83 volts per one meter. Mm, and I've they seen, use, yes. yes, they use that. In fact, I think that's the better rating to mm -hmm. use, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, what they're saying there is if you used a 2.83 volt signal <laughs> and mm. put that into an eight ohm speaker, you would end up using one watt. If you put the same 2.83 volt signal into a 4 ohm speaker, you'll end up using 2 watts, uh, both of them at 1 meter away. So right. if we have that sensitivity rating on our speaker, so let's say it is pretty normal, right? It's 87 decibels uh, either at 1 watt or 2.83 volts into an 8 ohm speaker, which ends up being the same thing, from 1 meter away. Well, that tells us now, okay, one watt gets sent into that speaker. I'm one meter away from it. It's going to play at 87 decibels, right. which means that if I were only sitting a meter away from that speaker, one watt is giving me more than sustained <laughs> reference volume. Yes. And, and we're already there. Now, what happens when you sit farther away? Well, if you were outdoors or in an anechoic chamber and you had no reinforcement from any reflections of any sort of room around you, every time you double your distance from a sound source, you, you, you lose six decibels of output. That's anechoic, all right? In an actual room, it's usually closer to about minus four decibels for every right. doubling of distance. And it changes a little bit on how reflective your room is. If you've got a really padded room, maybe it's more like five decibels every time you double the distance. If you've got a really reflective all glass and marble room, maybe it's more yeah. like minus three, just in terms of First sheer of all, output. don't have that. Just don't have yeah. that. <laughs> but about minus four is a pretty good 
uh, guess at what it's going to be. So, and I assume that changes depending on the frequency in different rooms too. It does to some extent. You know, of course, if you have a you know a padded room, but it's only thin padding, then the high frequencies mm. are going to be getting absorbed and and dying off faster than the base frequencies. Right. But yeah. we're all just you know we're trying to just get the right idea of how much amplification power do I need here. Right. So, uh, if we're assuming okay, we double that distance. So from one meter to two meters, from two meters to four meters. Mm -hmm. All right, we're gonna subtract about four decibels for every time we double that distance. So, I mean, saying four meters away, that's about 13 feet away. So in a decent sized home theater, that's fairly typical. You know, two uh, meters away is only about, you know, six and a half, not quite seven feet. So that's pretty close, right? So most of us are gonna be sitting somewhere in the three to four meter away range. Some people farther, some people closer, but you know, something around in there. So if you subtract about seven or eight decibels or so, it's gonna be something in that range from that initial speaker sensitivity figure subtract seven or eight decibels so let's say you're sitting like you know 10 11 feet away pretty typical mm -hmm. i would say yeah subtract about seven decibels from that initial figure so we we're starting with this theoretical but pretty typical speaker of 87 decibels one watt from one meter away mm -hmm. i'm sitting 10 11 feet away i'm gonna say that's about 80 decibels now for that one watt that i put sure. into it all right and that's that is that's pretty typical about one watt about 80 decibels coming at you with your seat, you know, 10, 11 feet away. So the other thing to know is that if you double the number of watts, you get three decibels more output. If you multiply the number of watts by 10, you get 10 decibels more output. Because so, logarithmic. <laughs> because it's logarithmic. So pretty quickly, we can say, okay, what do I need for 85 decibels? Well, I need about, double it would probably get me about 83 at my seat. Mm -hmm. Double it again, four watts now, would get me about 86. So yeah, I need something three to four watts. That's about what I need to sustain that 85 decibel output from this mm -hmm. pretty typically sensitive speaker at my pretty typical seating distance. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're saying to sustain reference volume you don't need 200 400 watts you need like three four sometimes right. a little less if you have a more sensitive speaker right but the, to the get peaks are what really get you to get to that peak let's say it is yeah you need like three watts or so to get to 85 well to get to 105 decibel peaks that's 20 decimals more right so mm -hmm. that's 10 times the amount 30 watts gets you 95 or so and then 10 times that, 300 watts for that actual 105 decibel peak. But that is a momentary, transient peak. Mm -hmm. We're not sustaining 105 decibels for a long amount of time. Oh, no, that would be ruinous to your hearing. And if we were to say, yeah, around 300 watts to hit that full 105 decibel peak, realize that any amplifier rated at half of that peak, so a 150 watt amplifier, can definitely provide 300 watts for a little short transient amount of right, time. Right, right, right. It's not that whatever the rating for the amplifier is, is the absolute brick wall maximum. No, it, it's got a little extra headroom in there. Mm -hmm. It just can't sustain it. If you have a 150 watt ampli uh, wattage amplifier, that means it can sustain 150 watts all day long. And then it can give you a peak of at least three decibels more per Pretty easily, but only for a short duration of time. So that's why we're saying in a lot of scenarios, yeah, your 100 watt rated amplifier uh, can definitely give you 200 watts on demand for a short amount of time. And that's probably giving you like 103 102 <laughs> decibel peaks, sure. right? Yeah. Are we, do we really care about, you know, absolutely 105, right? But that, that's the actual arithmetic of, of working it all out. If you know the sensitivity and you know your distance, if you know the nominal impedance, the ohms rating on that speaker, now you can tell whether we're dealing with one watt or like, let's say they, they used the rating, you know, 2.83 volts instead of one watt, but we know it's a four-ohm speaker. Well, now we know that that's actually like 87 decibels for two watts right. from one meter away, right? So you can work all of that out. So this really uh, brings up the point, it seems when you're starting from scratch, much more important to shop for your speakers first, then you know what amplifier power you need. I mean, I would say it's more important to know your room first. Room because, first, yes. Room first, then speakers. Yeah, yeah. You, you want to know your room and how far away you're going to be sitting. Right. And right. then, like, if you know you're going to be sitting 15, 20 feet away, yeah, even if you're prepared to buy a beefy amplifier, it would be a good idea to get some higher efficiency speakers at that mm -hmm. point. Because if you're starting with 92 decibels from one watt, 
Well, of course, now that you've maybe you've gone to, you know, closer to six meters away or something like that. Uh, probably not eight meters alone, not out of the question, maybe eight meters away, right? Ooh, so, I mean, now if you've lost, yeah, but, you know, now if you've lost, uh, you know, 10, 12 decibels of output just from distance, mm -hmm. but you were starting at 92, well, now if you lost 12 decibels just from distance away from the speaker, you're still starting at 80 decibels from one watt from, from that more watt, efficient yeah. speaker. <laughs> yeah, and we're back to the same calculation. The same three, uh, you know, 150 watt sustained, 300 watt peak amplifier can still give you full reference volume even from that distance away where you've right. lost 12 decibels because of distance. So yeah, it, it all works out. But yeah, the sensitivity and how far away you're sitting, they tell you most of what you need to know. There you go. So room first, then speakers, then amplifier power. That's right. I think that's the best way to look at it. Uh, let's see. Oh, my gosh. We talked so much about that. I lost my place. Okay. He's heard that in order to notice a change in the volume level, you basically need to double the power. So why are the differences in watts per channel so small when you go from, say, a mid-range receiver model to a flagship receiver model? He's noticed that across the board, the mid-range models will be rated at something like 100 or 110 watts per channel, two channels driven. And then the flagship receiver model will be like 125 watts per channel <laughs> yes. or maybe 150 watts per channel at most. Do those smaller increases in wattage benefit your system in any way whatsoever? whatsoever. Uh, mathematically, I, I would say it doesn't, right, from what we just discussed, but I swear I've noticed a large difference in the quality between your, say, 70-watt entry-level receivers ah. and your 100, 110-watt mm -hmm. receivers. That, that, and is it in my head? It may just be in my Not head. necessarily. So, I mean, as as I just mentioned, right, if you double the number of watts, that's three decibels more output. And three decibels is generally considered to be a noticeable increase in volume. Like, you're not going to mistake that it's around the same volume. You're going to be like, no, that was pretty clearly louder when it's three gotcha. decibels louder. Right, right, right. One decibel is essentially the minimum you need to be able to detect any reliable dis uh, difference between right, volume. Right. But you might question if something's only one decibel louder than the other. <laughs> uh, but that's sort of the minimum. So, you know, when we're saying from 100 to 125, or like you mentioned, from say 70 to 110, you're right. definitely getting like one or two more decibels right. uh, in terms of just headroom, like maximum output. But of course, yeah. if you're saying like one was 110, and one was 125. No, that like, yeah, maybe half a, a half a decibel more output. We're not talking about dramatically more headroom. But where there can be a little bit more of a difference is it's an indication when you're saying that this amplifier is able to sustain 125 watts versus 100 watts, that if you're looking at what is the maximum am amount of current that can pass through that one amplifier channel, mm. the 100 watt per channel amplifier is going to reach like full saturation. It just can't pass any more current through its transistors. Whereas the 125 watt one can pass a little bit more current through. Not a tremendous amount more, mm -hmm. but it can pass a little bit more current through and probably sustain that for longer. So it's not that there's zero difference, but you're like, this is why we keep saying, yeah, don't go from the Denon X 3800 to the X 4800 just because you want 120 watts instead of 110. Like right. that isn't going to make some kind of gigantic difference to your sound. It's 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 just not there. Um, but in terms of like total uh, power supply that is available and total amount of current that can go through each of those amplifier channels, there there can be a little bit more than a I wouldn't call it an insignificant difference. I would call it a very small, but right. not insignificant difference. So if your speaker drops down a little bit lower in impedance at some points, being able to put that little bit extra current through can have some audible benefit, but it's right. small. Like, like we're saying, if you want to make a real difference, then yeah, you got to get that 300, 500 watt amplifier, but also have speakers that aren't sensitive enough and you're sitting far enough away from that you're actually ever going to use that amount right. of power. And very often you're not. So I just I wonder how much placebo effect I yes. I get I get uh, like like I said I, I always maybe it's other things about these receivers when I've heard one that's in that class of like seven yeah. watts and then I hear one that's a hundred hundred ten watts it's not just the watts there's other stuff going on there's just more I don't know is it placebo or am I hearing better accuracy power 
no i mean there, there, there could easily be like a full three decibels difference in terms of headroom because the the current that's going through that 70 watt per channel is is significantly lower you know it is right. like almost half of the amount of current that's going through say the 110 watt one so there you're getting into you know genuine audible differences in terms of the headroom and then yeah just you know the the overall power supply that's there if you're cooking up more than two speakers you are dividing right. all of that power supply power to all the speakers they're not probably all playing exactly the same thing at exactly the same time right. it's not true all channels driven but some of that power is being diverted mm -hmm. and if you had a much sm smaller pool to begin with well now maybe there's only 30 watts available on tap and that's all you can send well, you know, just like the guys buying the $100 dongles to take your network distortion yeah. away, I like to think I can hear things. I like <laughs> to think I can, but I always distrust my senses because I know how powerful placebo yes. is. When you know what you're listening to, it's amazing what your expectation can lead you to believe you that bet. you heard. Here comes Will with a question. Uh, we have discussed Will's 2.1 desktop setup a couple of times recently, and we suggested either using a Fossi, a Fossi, that's a Fossi or a Fossi, Fossi, Fossi. Fossi. using a Fossi amplifier to power the SVS Prime satellite speakers that he already owns, or possibly getting a pair of self-powered speakers that have a subwoofer output. Mm -hmm. He also wanted to get a subwoofer and all for under $400. So we had suggested getting a Dayton sub. And we also suggested why we thought having a USB audio input might be a good idea since he's connecting all of this to a Mac Mini, which only has its headphone jack if he wants to use an analog audio connection. Mm -hmm. Well, funnily enough, on the subwoofer end of things, he finally remembered that he already had a Mirage Omni S12 sub in storage. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have a 12-inch sub. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> No, it's like I, 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 I've done things like that Oh, before. yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, I got a whole other television. Uh, <laughs> he thought it might be a bit too big, but it actually fits under his desk perfectly. And it also has front-mounted controls, so that solved several issues. I have a sub right under this desk as I mm -hmm. sit here now. It's wonderful. I can kick it if I want to. Uh, <laughs> next, he bought the Fosse DA2120C amplifier we had recommended, but he got it off of eBay. The unit he got produces sound just fine, but the display on the front doesn't seem to work at all. Hmm. Neither the seller nor Fosse's customer service were able to help get it working, so he's sending it back. Good choice. While he was testing it, he discovered a couple of things. If he used his Mac Mini's headphone jack to output the audio, it didn't seem to have any sort of audible noise floor, which was something we had born to check. But it did occasionally produce some static. Yeah. <laughs> static. So he switched to the... I'm just... They're like thinking of like old television static and FM yeah. radio. Well, static. that's like, you know, like if I plug in my headphones and I kind of rotate it in the headphone jack, sometimes you yeah. get that little yes. as you rotate it. So could yeah. be something like that. I've got some old devices that do that. Mm -hmm. So he switched to the USB output, which has uh, which was nice and clean. But then he discovered that the volume buttons on his keyboard no longer function. <laughs> yeah. He, he checked online, and it does seem to be the case that when you send audio from a Mac Mini via USB, the volume level coming out of the computer is fixed, which kind of makes sense to me. So you'd have to use the volume control on your amp or self-powered speakers. Mm -hmm. So now he's trying to decide. Should he get the same Fosse amplifier model from Amazon, or should he get the Jammo? Is it Jamo or Jammo? Yammo, Yammo. It's Yammo. Mm -hmm. Is it? It's Yammo, but it's, it's Fosse. Yammo. People got to work on their spelling. <laughs> Yammo. So that's uh, Hispanic. Yammo. Self-powered speakers that we suggested. Okay. Most important to him is which would sound better. And by better, he means which would be the most neutral. He, he does like the looks of the Yamo self-powered speakers, and he likes that the setup would be a bit cleaner with fewer wires and boxes. But the Fosse amp, a fully functional one this time, <laughs> and his SVS Prime satellites would sound more neutral, then he'd still prefer that overall. What do we say? Yeah. I always like standalone speakers, me, if you can help it. Yeah. I amp speaker. That's always my leaning. And but of you course, can buy it would some be very good self-powered speakers. You sure can. Of course, it would be very easy. You're going to have that obviously on your desk, uh, almost certainly within arm's reach. So just reaching over there to turn the volume dial wouldn't be the end of the world anymore. I, I do it all the time, right? A little bit of muscle memory to relearn if you were used to adjusting the volume quickly on your keyboard, but I think you'd be able to get used to that pretty right, quick. Right. I do have to say though, <laughs> as as much as I I I would love to be able to say that's the way I 100% think you should go. The Yamo speakers, those are part of their, their S-Studio series, which I like quite a lot, but 
they do have a little bit of a characteristic sound. Uh, Yamo is part of the same parent company as Klipsch. Uh, okay. And the Yamo speakers that they're putting out in that, in that uh, lower cost, in that S-Studio series, um, they've got a smiley face curve to them. A, gotcha. a fairly obvious smiley face curve to them, which is... By and large, often very pleasant. It means it sounds like it's detailed in the high end and full mm. in the you know mid bass end. Uh, but it's a pretty noticeable uh, smiley face curve. Now, if you can apply some EQ inside of your computer, it's pretty easy to flatten that out mm. if you want to. It's not like a really aggressive V notch in the response or anything like okay. that. But it's a it's a pretty obvious that it's got a bit of a smiley face curve to it. So if what you want are speakers that are just on their own neutral, tell it like it is. I think your SVS Prime satellites are closer to that. Yes. Um, the the Yamos I would describe as having a, a bit of a coloration to their sound. Uh, not bad, not unpleasant, but some coloration to the sound. So I think it's worth, in your case, get one of those Fosse amplifiers brand new from Amazon. It's, it's not that much more expensive than what you found on eBay. Uh, even if that one doesn't work, send it back, because, I mean, Amazon's very easy to return in exchange. That's um, right. And then, you know, position that little Fosse amplifier on your desk so that the volume's within easy reach. And even though, yeah, it's a couple more cables to go, I think for what you described, that's what I would recommend in this case. I also like the flexibility. And if something breaks, it's not the whole thing. That's true. Yeah. You know, Plus, like he already it. has those satellites just sitting there. So it's yeah. kind of like... And they're good. So They're very I, good. Yeah. And they're very good neutral. Around. Very. Uh, moving on now to Henry. First up, Henry says, thanks for discussing his center channel clarity issues recently. He got it rectified and dialogue sounds clear now, so that went well. For his display, he uses a JVC NX5 projector with a 16x9 screen. His sources are a Panasonic UB9000 Ultra HD Blu-ray player with Panasonic's most extensive HDR optimizer options, as well as an Apple TV 4K and a cable box. He has been intrigued by all of the coverage of the Lumigen and Mad VR <laughs> external video processors. Yeah, if you're hanging around on YouTube in the home theater corners, how can you not have been inundated by all of that? Intrigued by the coverage, yes. <laughs> yep. His JVC NX5 has frame-by-frame -frame dynamic tone mapping and JVC's mm -hmm. theater optimizer setup, but the differences shown in the way the video processors handle HDR content looks compelling mm. so it's intriguing and compelling <laughs> and then he also kind of dug all the things they can do with aspect ratios and non-linear stretch settings although he isn't sure they'd be of any use in his system <laughs> <laughs> we, we can we talk through whether it's worth the price to add one of these video processors to his system yes let's talk through it no <laughs> all right lee seems pretty definitive on his moving and... on to the next question <laughs> all right <laughs> So, I mean, this is this is one of the things where because of my approach to to my, my whole always North Star guiding light of the way yes. I want to answer questions is what is the answer I would want to receive if I didn't know about this stuff and I were the right. one asking the questions? What's the answer I would want to receive? And the answer I want to receive is as as down the middle, not influenced by either the marketing or you know, unnecessary biased hatred for things, be, you right, know, right. or I can't afford it. So nobody else should even want it type <laughs> of things. Like I want, I want the down the middle answer. Like yeah. what, what's the actual case here? And that is unfortunately difficult to convey in, in it. So like if it's, if it's, this is so worth it that save up for and get it. That's an easy answer. If this is, it really isn't worth it at all. Don't get it. That's an easy answer on the Lumigen and the mad VR. Partly because they are expensive. They're multi-thousands of dollars, you yeah. know, $7,000 up type of price range. So, yeah. you know, if this was $500, I'd almost say, yeah, just go get it. Yeah, like, go try just, it. Yeah. <laughs> even if you end up not using it, like, un unless that's really going to put a hurting on you, like, just go grab it. Even, you know, upwards to $1,500, $2,000, I'd be keener on saying, you know what? You'll probably like the results, so go ahead and get it if you can afford it. But when, like, to me, yeah, you get into that $7,000, $8,000, $10,000, dollar type of price range it's like mm, i question a little bit more now look again if that's nothing to you if that amount of money is is absolutely nothing to you then you're probably really gonna like the results uh most people who have them do which is why you see so much positive comment about it and i can understand why what are they actually doing okay so one thing i have a little Good bit question. of question a little bit of a complaint about uh particularly it's more with the way mad vr has been um 
marketed, okay? I don't really blame anything on the engineering side of these processors, but on the marketing side, MadVR has had a little bit more of, well, you're seeing it, uh, you know, like the Dolby Cinema standard, and that is like factually untrue <laughs> because what you're seeing in a Dolby Cinema has been mastered specifically for a Dolby Cinema, whereas what you're watching at home is the home release in one form or another, whether that's mm -hmm. the disc or a streaming service or even Kaleidoscape. It is a home release that has not been mastered mastered for a Dolby Cinema. So under no circumstances are you actually seeing exactly what you would see in a Dolby Cinema. So I have a little beef with the marketing just on that. But in concept, I understand sort of what they're like trying to convey in terms of feeling like, okay, you're going to see something at home that is more similar to a Dolby Cinema. So I have a little bit of a nit to pick with that as well. Because if you're looking at the examples of what does an HDR image look like on a, on a JVC projector or a really good Sony projector, what does the HDR image look like on one of those compared to just what's built into the projector itself? And you will pretty much always see in the demonstrations, whether it's a Lumigen or a Mad VR, more shadow detail visible when the Lumigen or the Mad VR is in the signal chain. And typically... Uh, more highlight detail too, particularly if they do the thing where it's like you're inside a very dark shadowy room, but there's a window to outside. Mm. And so they'll show you the image where you're seeing both more detail in the shadowy parts of the dark room and more detail in the bright thing that's just outside the window. And they'll be like, see, that's why you gotta have one of these things. And the fans of them will be like, that, that's why I have one. I mm. love it. Mm. I see this shadow detail and this highlight detail that I lose if I don't have one of these devices in my signal chain. So two nits mm. to pick that I have with that. If we're talking straight down the line, <laughs> truth in, in, in the answer that I'm giving. Let's do. <laughs> one, if you were to bring a mastering monitor, one of those $30,000, 30-inch Sony mastering monitors, either the OLED version or the dual LCD panel version, mm. and show that very same scene exactly nit for nit, for what the signal said to do. Mm -hmm. You would see less shadow detail in the $30,000 mastering monitor than you would see with the Lumigen or the Mad VR at their default HDR settings, okay? They mm. are, in all the comparison images I have seen where they're just like touting what it'll do, mm -hmm. they are boosting the shadow detail beyond the like what was actually called for in the signal. Now, they're kind of justified in doing that in two ways. One, none of the projectors have zero nit black the way right. the $30,000 OLED mastering monitor does. So that mm. means the black floor where they're starting is already somewhere into the shadow detail range. And if you are going to see the shadow detail that is visible on the $30,000 mastering monitor, you got to boost everything above the black floor a commiserate mm. amount so that you're still seeing everything there. So that's one, and that's that's legitimate. You kind of want to do that. But the other side of it is they're doing it so you very obviously see more shadow detail than if you don't have it in the signal chain. Okay. And at that point, it is actually, despite all the marketing, straying ever so slightly from original content creator's intent. Mm -hmm. Now, the other down-the-line truthful answer to this is you can adjust that in these video processors. <laughs> you can manually calibrate it so that it is bang on and looks exactly like that mastering monitor. Okay. They have that adjustment capability. So it's not as though they inherently do harm, but by default, they're set up to show you more, sta uh, more shadow detail than the mastering monitor actually would. Then on the other side, because you're dealing with a projector here and not a 1,000 or a 4,000 nit display, mm -hmm. uh, it is necessary to tone map the highlight detail. Now there, that is a matter of choice. That's a matter of personal preference because you could say, okay, you know what? I'm just going to stay accurate to the HDR signal as high as I can and then clip everything off above that. Or I'm going to try mm -hmm. to retain as much of the highlight detail as I possibly can, but necessarily compress the entire range of light into what the projector can right. show. Or I can fall somewhere in between, right? And what the Lumigen and the MadVR by default, again, by default, mm -hmm. tend to do is they will keep the mid-range portion, the SDR portion of the signal, pretty darn accurate. Because if you stray from that, it's pretty obvious. It, it gets bad that, quickly, yes. Yeah, that something's over-brightened or over-dimmed. Mm -hmm. But then they are 
aggressive in how much they tone map the highlights to, to retain as much detail as they possibly can. I don't have any problem with that. That's right, a choice. Right. And right. again, if you manually want to change that, you can. So well, it's see, all the, adjustable in there. The thing that pops into my head immediately is a, a, a nice projector like that NX5 is aware that it is a projector and has limitations. One would think that a projector would tone map to itself well enough. Well, so this is <laughs> where we think... get into what can the NX5 or, you know, any of the JVC higher end projectors, what can they do inherently? They do have this frame by frame dynamic tone mapping. Right. So they aren't just clipping off detail. They are changing mm. on the fly. Mm. Uh, and then they also have, so JVC has their own calibration software. Uh, not not Calman or any, you know, you can also use Calman on it, but they have their own JVC calibration software, which is very limiting in that they only give you two light meters that it works with. You, you have to use one of those two light meters. Uh, one of them is a basic, quite basic colorimeter, a Spider X Pro. It's, Good it's, old spider, it's, yeah. It's decent, but it's, it's certainly not high end. And the other one is a, a, a spectrophotoradiometer, uh, an i1 Pro, uh, which is, you know, certainly more expensive than the Spider, more accurate than the Spider, but is slow to read <laughs> what is coming off the screen. It takes a long time if you're using that device. See, if you so get paid by the hour, though, to calibrate. Right. Yeah. Now... In that JVC calibration software, you can manually adjust the gamma curve, including for HDR. Yeah. So if you want those more shadow detail, those slightly raised shadow details to make it look an awful lot, like what the Lumagen or the Mad VR mm -hmm. does by default, mm -hmm. you can do it. Mm -hmm. It's possible to do it. But I will say it's certainly not as fast. It's not as intuitive. And you're limited to these two not spectacular user experience light meters to do it. So it is more limited in that sense. Then if you switch over to Calman and manually calibrate that way, uh, there's a lot you can do through through that calibration software. You can use meters that you prefer, just like you could with the Lumigen or the Mad VR, but you don't have quite the gamma control. You, you have to use JVC's own calibration software to unlock uh, a similar amount of gamma control as what the Lumigen and the Mad VR give you. So all of this is to say, if you are willing to invest much more time than money, mm -hmm. you can get to pretty darn similar looking results either way. <laughs> right, right, right. All right. Now, if you have much more money than time and you really <laughs> like the way the Lumigens and the Mad VRs make HDR look by default. You don't mind that they're artificially raising the shadow detail a bit because you just love seeing that detail in the shadows and you like their default approach of retaining as much highlight detail as you possibly can, mm -hmm. right? And you're like, you know what? The $7,000, I got that, but I don't have the time to mess around with two different pieces of calibration software and buying at right. least two different meters, you know, which ups the cost once you do that or hiring someone to do that and the time it takes them to do that. Um, you know, like I can see a way to getting to that Lumigen and that Mad VR that totally makes sense because the results you can get from it, if you want to go with the default, I understand why people really like it. Mm -hmm. If you want to manually calibrate it, you can do a spectacular job manually calibrating them. Clearly, uh, they have tuned it for what a majority of high end projector owners like the looks of with their subjective. And eyeballs. why wouldn't you? <laughs> and that, you know so that. that's, yeah, I mean, that's fine. But, you know, I you can tell by my reaction to this and how I've reacted to all kinds of things in the past that I'm Captain Budget, right? Like, sure. you have to really blow me away yeah. and show me that I can't do it any other way for me to spend a lot of money on a thing. Right. OLED did that for me. High def back in the day in the first place on a plasma did that for me. Yeah. Uh, other technology has done it for me. But when I hear several thousand dollars yes, yeah. and I can get awful close by tweaking it myself in the projector... Yes. But like uh, I want to be, can't, I can't go there. I can't. But I, I want to understand if you got money to burn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to be unequivocal. If you are using a combination of Calman, JVC's own calibration software, and then kind of hacking their HDR uh, optimizer that they have in there, because to again, to get exactly the same sort of shadow detail and, and uh, highlight retention results, you, you, you got to trick it a little bit okay. All right. <laughs> in that Fair HDR enough. optimizer. Like, it's a lot of back and forth. It's a lot of tedium and time. Mm -hmm. Like that's what you're, instead of just dollars, you're sinking time uh, right. or somebody else's time, which well, ends up why being dollars. You, right? you very quickly said, hey, if it was $500, okay, oh, no, yeah. whoa, 500 oh, God, yeah. 
yeah. is, is a different number than 7,000. And, and even 1,500, 2,000, like for the type of budgets that I'm thinking about, I'm like, yeah, I can see to where this is $1,500 of my time easily. Okay, where sure. I just, I buy this box, I plug it in and I love the results versus I sink hours of tedium and back and forth fiddling in the settings that aren't always user intuitive says like, the guy that wrote a 12 step demon program for, that's for right. setting up subwoofers <laughs> well that's what but i mean see that was the free way to do it or right, right you can spend right. some money to speed this all up so i mean that that is my answer i see value in the Lumigen and the Mad VR. I don't want to be the person saying, oh, they're expensive, so, you know, they're, they're right. garbage. Like, absolutely not. I see value in them, 100%. But are they necessary? No. And furthermore, do they actually meet the marketing of, this is this is exactly what you're going to see in a Dolby Cinema. Like, I have a little quibble with that marketing because I, I don't think it's actually straight down the road truthful. I think they're they're bending <laughs> the yeah, truthfulness yeah. of that yeah, a little sure, bit in sure. the marketing. Um, and, and then, yeah, what, what they can achieve and how much I think you'll like it. Like, I see the value there, but it is not... The people who are like, this is the only way to do it, I I just disagree with that. Right. But I agree it is painful to get there without it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. And I guess if you're in the JVC NX5 budget range, maybe it doesn't sound as crazy to you. But right. you know, to, to me, I'm the kind of person that has saved up for big things. Yeah. And once I have the big thing, I can't justify a slight enhancement for you know that much money right that, yeah I, I couldn't do it but uh, okay i'm i mean you know if you got the money and you like the effect you buy it yeah <laughs> that's okay yeah. it's america or canada <laughs> <laughs> or another part of the world <laughs> buy it hey what if we answer new questions for just a few minutes let's try yeah <laughs> see what we can crack out i don't know when you have to leave i might carry on without you because i want to get through a, a number of these we'll if see we how far we can go you got let's me for good far. maybe 45 minutes from now let's see what happens uh so uh, Nick has questions. Nick has an LG C9 OLED and a Denon X3600H receiver. He uses a first-gen Apple TV 4K as his primary streaming device, and he isn't keen on switching source devices for different streaming services if he doesn't have to. None of us are. <laughs> uh, he had his Apple TV 4K output set up the way we recommended, 4K SDR as the default, with match frame rate and match dynamic range both turned on. This seemed to be working well, with the output switching to HDR10 or Dolby Vision only when the content called for it, and switching back to SDR output for SDR content as it should. Dolby Atmos also worked properly. Sounds amazing. But the YouTube app is the problem. Interesting. Mm. I get good results from the LG television YouTube app. Yeah. It seems to have a slow HDMI handshake. So whenever the ads come on, the screen goes blank for several seconds. Huh. Seemingly because of a frame rate switch. When the ads end, he misses the first several seconds of the video, even though the audio plays fine. <laughs> so he tried turning off match frame rate. That way, everything comes out as 4K60 all the time. And his LG C9 is good at applying reverse 3-2 pull down, so 24 frame per second content from other apps still looked okay. And that setting helped a lot with YouTube. However, he discovered that HBO Max would no longer switch into Dolby Vision <laughs> mode. Ah, oh, this kind of stuff. Yup. <laughs> It seems it is somehow tied to the frame rate also being a match for the original content. So is there anything we can suggest that will let him get the best experience from all of his apps coming out of his Apple TV 4K? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, God, boy, I wish we could. I wish right? it were that easy. Like the built-in um, LG OLED apps on the television uh -huh. uh, switch real quick between oh, yes. HDR and Audi. I mean, just like instantly almost. So those are great. And, and I, I do have to say, like, the YouTube app on the Apple TV 4K is not just hand, flat out, it is not the best way to watch YouTube. Okay. Uh, that is one of the apps where the Apple TV 4K just doesn't have the good version of a YouTube app. Um, it, it's missing several features, right? They don't support the AV1 codec. So the, the best support for the newest uh, codec support that's out there uh, being used by YouTube, the Apple TV 4K just doesn't do it. Just flat out doesn't do it. So there's plenty of videos that you can't watch in HDR through an Apple TV 4K, even though they're in HDR and available to see in HDR through other devices apps. Um, so that, that's sort of the main thing. So uh, my, my honest advice to you is 
Exactly, like Lee just alluded to, I would use your LG's built-in YouTube app for YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. The other streaming services, I'd use your Apple TV 4K. (laughs) But for YouTube specifically, if you're willing to, I would just bite the bullet and use the YouTube app that's built into the LG because they actually have a very good YouTube app. The LG OLEDs have a very good YouTube app already built in. So that's my real answer to you. The only other thing that you could really do is to to not do any of the match settings in the Apple TV 4K. Mm. So you have match frame rate off and match dynamic range off, and now you just have the Apple TV 4K always outputting 4K 60 in either Dolby Vision or HDR 10, take your choice. Mm. It does a perfectly reasonable job of taking SDR content and putting it into an HDR container. Mm. It does a perfectly reasonable job of doing that. So now you never have new HDMI handshakes. You never have any blanking in between things. Okay. Uh, th- that that would be the option there. Uh, I suppose the other option would be to get the brand newest Apple TV 4K and the brand newest 2023 LG OLED because both of them now support quick uh, media switching. Mm-hmm. So uh, essentially variable frame rate for video sources, All right. <laughs> uh, variable refresh rate for video sources. So there's no more blank screen when the frame rate changes with those two devices, but that's a whole lot of money uh, for this one issue. So yeah, those are the two solutions. I'm not super happy to do the the Apple TV 4K is just always outputting HDR and always 60 frames per second. I like being able to get the content out the way the content came in. Right, right, right. <laughs> but he's got um, two things he can try. You got those two things. The yeah. YouTube TV app on the LG. So yeah. Try, try that. See if you like yeah. switching back and forth uh, yeah. and see how it looks and then try what... Because I mean, uh, when, it's, when it's one specific service like that, I think that's doable. It's not too bad. The yeah. so far my only complaint about apps on our older LG OLED is the YouTube TV app. Right. Sometimes it just don't wanna. <laughs> and there's nothing you can it, you you hit the menu, you go back and forth. I've had to turn the TV off and then finally it's better lately. Every, yeah. All these things are like little creatures with personalities <laughs> and they change over time. Yes. Uh, and also the YouTube TV app on an LG OLED has a three or four second delay okay. that other devices don't have. And so when In terms I'm syncing of the live up like feed. a yeah. live football or basketball game yeah. across two rooms yeah. where you can kind of hear both TVs sometimes, yeah. yeah, I have to like pause the Roku in one room for <laughs> three and a half seconds. <laughs> <laughs> to get it to match up. And so then it's not live anymore. Then the neighbors uh, across the, the joy. street can scream and yell at That's a touchdown. That's right, yes. Oh, and I haven't coming. seen it yet. <laughs> Uh-oh, here comes a wave. <laughs> All right, moving on to Gurinder, uh for a question new this week. Disney has their Disney Movie Insiders Reward Program. When you create an account and register your movie tickets, disc purchases, digital purchases, and Disney Plus subscription with them, you earn reward points that you can redeem for things like collectibles, posters, and Blu-rays. Can I just interject how much I'm sick of rewards with every organization I do business oh, with? Oh, they like them, yep. Every, Keep you in their the ecosystem. grocery store, the place mm-hmm. that cuts my hair, everybody's got Gas a reward. And I'm like, you know what? No, I don't want rewards. I don't want discounts anymore. No. Just can I just give you the thing and pay for the thing? <laughs> anyway, it's AV rant. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you buy a physical disc and register that disc purchase to get your Disney Movie Insiders points, can the digital movie code be redeemed by someone else? <laughs> or is it all tied together where the digital movie code that came with the disc will also be tied to your Disney Movie Insiders account? In other words, guessing, probably wanting to let someone else use give them the that. digital movie code yes right. yes 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 so uh they have it in the small print it is in the small print of right. that doofy uh disney movie insiders thing the small print says that you can only get those insiders reward points if your movies anywhere account is also linked to your disney movie insiders account wah, so wah. there you go if someone else uh, uh redeems the digital movie code uh through their movies anywhere account uh your disney movie insiders account will not get the points it's just uh, too so much that, work it's so that'll much work nowadays i'm so sick of accounts and rewards and points and logging in and logging out and updating i just miss clicking things yeah so they uh so they do have you link though the uh the uh the Uh, digital download version they have they you link that to your disney movie insiders uh rewards point program so there you go gee i wonder why people pirate things (laughs) sean has a question 
Uh, Sean came across a Panasonic UB9000 Ultra HD Blu-ray player for sale at a substantial discount. He already has a Sony X800 Ultra HD Blu-ray player, and his display is an LG OLED. Would getting the Panasonic player be a worthwhile upgrade? Is that enough of a difference between a Sony X800 and a Panasonic UB9000? Indeed. So let's talk about the the two main things that a Panasonic UB9000 does that a Sony X800 doesn't, uh, and then decide if with an LG OLED as your display, if either of those two things are a benefit to you. So first and foremost, both of them do support Dolby Vision from Ultra HD Blu-rays. But the Sony X800, like all Sony Ultra HD Blu-ray players, has the ridiculous restriction where you have to manually turn Dolby Vision on and off. Hmm. It does not detect that Dolby Vision is part of whatever disc you're playing. You have to manually turn it on, and if you forget to turn it off, you're still going to get a Dolby Vision flag coming out of the player, even though the disc you're playing isn't Dolby Vision anymore, uh. and it's a pain. So, the Panasonic UB9000 does what we would expect any player to do and yes. automatically detects if it's a Dolby Vision disc or not and will output Dolby Vision when that's on the disc, and we'll switch back to regular HDR10 when Dolby Vision is not on the disc. That's so that is a like very it. nice little convenience uh, when you're switching back and forth whatever HDR format is on your Ultra HD Blu-rays. The other thing that the Panasonic UB9000 has that the Sony X800 does not is Panasonic's HDR Optimizer. So Panasonic's HDR Optimizer is not frame-by-frame -frame dynamic tone mapping. Many people get confused by that. They think the Panasonic is just, you know, analyzing the signal and applying tone mapping frame by frame. It is not doing that. Mm -hmm. It is a single static tone map using Panasonic's approach to tone okay. mapping. So what this will do is, let's say you're playing a disc. It's HDR10. It has peaks that go up to 4,000 nits, at least according to the HDR10 metadata. Maybe that's true in the actual content or not, but the metadata told the Panasonic player that th this disc has some peak somewhere in the movie that's 4,000 nits. You can set the Panasonic UB9000 to output a maximum of 1,500 nits, 1,000 nits, 500 nits, 300 nits, and I think even down to 200 nits because it has more options in the low ranges uh, than, than any other player. Very handy for a projector. All right, because uh, yes. your projector likely isn't going above 200 nits. And if that gives you the option to say, hey, tone map this ahead of time, all right? Don't send an HDR10 signal to my projector directly that says something in this movie is as bright as 4,000 nits and then rely on my projector's tone mapping to deal with that because it's <laughs> going to make everything too dark yes. if it tries to retain Dramatically that 4,000 so. <laughs> Instead, put the Panasonic player in between those two things, have the Panasonic player tone map down to 200 nits and then send that signal to the uh, projector where the projector doesn't really have to do any more tone mapping. Uh, th there can be double tone mapping going on with it, but uh, you know, you're essentially saying, okay, just, just set the Panasonic so that it's already pre-tone mapping it. So now my display doesn't have to tone map it again. With an LG OLED, I would say that's completely unnecessary. Right. Uh, the LG OLED has its own frame by frame dynamic tone mapping that does a really nice job of retaining all the highlight detail. So I would say about the only reason you might want to get it is for the convenience of Dolby Vision, not having to turn it on and off manually. Uh, it's not that you can't play Dolby Vision with your X800. You can. You just have to manually toggle Dolby Vision That's on really and off, which is really dumb. But, uh, you know, so then you say, okay, is it worthwhile? Well, now I have to put that back onto you because whatever price you're seeing for that UB9000, those are the features that the 9000 could offer you. In this instance, I don't really think the HDR optimizer is of much benefit to you. Your display already tone maps things excellently on its own and really doesn't need to utilize that Panasonic HDR optimizer. So it's pretty much strictly about the convenience of Dolby Vision. Right on. Let's move on to a question from Daz, who, by the way, uploads beautiful barbecue videos. Oh, yeah. He does. I, I keep saying I need to go eat at his house. Uh, <laughs> first up, he heard our discussion last week regarding Richard's plans for his basement renovation, including putting the theater area in the open portion of the basement and dedicating a small enclosed room to being a home gym. As someone who has put his home theater in an open T-shaped basement himself, Daz had several thoughts. In short, he agreed with all of the things Tom and Rob warned about. If your goal is strong, deep bass that puts a commercial movie theater to shame, you're going to struggle with placement. 
having to use much larger and more expensive subwoofers and especially soundproofing. If that's the kind of bass you want, achieving it in the small enclosed room would be infinitely easier. I don't know about <laughs> infinitely, but yes, easier. Uh, Daz also envisioned that their whole family would watch movies together, so he wanted the much larger room and even created two rows of seats. But actually getting all four kids together to watch a movie at the same time is tougher than self-dentistry, he says. <laughs> Uh, he, he also envisioned having friends and extended family over for entertaining. But when people do come over, they don't want to sit in the dark for two hours. So all in all, he'd rather use the large open portion of his basement as a bar with space for a pool table. And once a couple of kids move out, he'll put the theater into the basement bedroom. And it sounds as though Richard might discover similar experiences. So <laughs> Daz agrees that rethinking the layout of the home gym and home theater would be a good idea. So those are his thoughts for Richard. Yeah, he just wanted to share because he's like, mm, I think I've been through a similar line of thinking and it might have done things a little differently if you had them to do over. So. And now on to his six pages of questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> while his current theater remains in his open basement, he still intends to keep two rows of seats. He's using a makeshift riser at the moment, just some old box springs with OSB on top to make a platform and covered with fitted sheets. So <laughs> it's the devil's bed. <laughs> he he figures making a DIY seating riser is something he could pull off now, so he's trying to plan the ideal riser height. His ceiling is only seven and a half feet, and he's got the second row about six feet behind the front row. Six feet behind the front row, yeah. He, mm -hmm. he used Audio Advice's theater design tool, and it said to make the riser 15 and a half inches tall. But is that a bit too high, maybe? What do we say? I say that sounds awful high in a place with only seven and a half foot ceilings. Yes, it does. Yeah, I mean, what they're going for is no obstruction in the sight line for the rear seat whatsoever, right? Which I would say even in a commercial movie theater, I mean, if I guess you have the, the full racked stadium seating like in an IMAX, that's what you get. But I mean, even in a lot of theaters with tiered seating, like the tippy top of some tall person in front of you, like their head might, you know, obstruct a tiny bit of the bottom portion of the screen or something, yeah. but you just don't have the thing where they're, you know, like the old theaters where, you know, the, the seats were more or less uh, all on the same height, oh, just a slight rise, awful. you know, <laughs> then you were getting a lot of the screen blocked out. So I don't think you need to do the full 15 and a half inches from there because that's yeah. for completely unobstructed. And I think that will be too high. They, you know, with their ceiling already a little bit low, right, that right. sounds too high. Also, by code, right, steps for anything are supposed to be a maximum of seven and a half inches high, that, that standard go. stair height. So if you go more than 15 inches, you have to have two steps. That's right. <laughs> like That's by right. code, you're supposed to have two steps. If you went 14 or 15 inches, you, you are supposed to put a single step uh, in between the floor and the top of that riser. And that complicates um, your construction a little bit. Yeah, it does. So, I mean, here's another thing where, like, if you just have a single step... You're, that's allowed to be eight inches, right? So if you have more than an eight inch riser, you're supposed to have a step, um, you know? So, I mean, most people would say that if this is like sort of getting built into a two row theater, uh, that, you know, something in the range of 10 to 12 inches is usually very comfortable. A lot of people make do with the eight inch riser yeah, for the yeah. simplicity of not having to build a step into it. And yes, you know, the top of the person's head in the front row will obstruct some of the bottom portion mm -hmm. of the screen. But if you're willing to raise the screen up a little bit so that everyone's looking up a little bit in their reclined seats uh, at the screen instead of straight ahead, mm -hmm. and you're okay with a little bit of the bottom maybe being obstructed by somebody's head, like the eight inch riser can work really well. So also, that's the way I would put it to he's, you. The, the, the second row is six feet behind the front row. It's not it like is. in a theater yeah. where it's directly behind yeah. the yeah. row. So yeah, I like the idea of the one eight inch step up yeah person. that's you know like uh, to me like you said actually having everybody in the theater at the same time is kind of a rare occurrence in your house yeah, yeah. so i'm not sure i would go to the extent of like yeah there's a riser that requires a step to be built yeah. into it like I, i'd probably just stop at the eight inch riser <laughs> plus this is your family you can tell who that's to sit right. where <laughs> put the short person right here put I'm a cushion sit. on the seat in the back row and yeah, raise them up yeah. a little bit that and way just to keep it simple man that eight inch uh mm -hmm. with the seven and a half foot tall ceilings um anyway since Daz's eldest son has moved out for college, 
Daz's niece, who lives with them, gets to take over the basement bedroom, and Daz's nephew, who lives with them, gets to move out of the basement storage room. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> yeah. He's just in the storage room. Uh, Daz <laughs> figures uh, he should follow his own advice that he just gave to Richard, so he's trying to plan how to move his home theater into that storage room. Mm. The thing is, there's lots of HVAC ducting in the ceiling oof, of that storage room that really cannot be covered with a drywall ceiling. And there is currently only a single electrical outlet in there, although the electrical panel for the house is in that room, so adding more outlets would be easy. And the storage room is not air conditioned. This sounds terrible. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Daz is more concerned about the acoustics inside the theater and not as concerned about soundproofing. So he was thinking he could just fill the ceiling bays with insulation, then attach fabric to make it look nice, but not actually close in the ceiling at all. What are our thoughts about moving his home theater into this basement storage room? Don't do it. No, that sounds terrible. <laughs> Not this one. Wait, wait until the the basement bedroom is available. Yeah. Uh, eventually, that'll that'll come to pass. Uh, I, I would not do this. I mean, this is sounding an awful lot like a utility room more than a storage room. Although I guess maybe <laughs> yeah. the maybe the furnace isn't in there, so that's why it's not the utility room. But you know, the electrical panel is in there. But mainly, it's if you've got a bunch of HVAC truck trunks all converging in that yeah, room yeah. don't put your theater in there just no. just don't there's, there's no way you're not going to have noise from the hvac system in your theater while you're watching mm -hmm. something and there's no way you're not going to have all of the sound from the theater permeating throughout the whole darn house through the <laughs> hvac like you're literally you, ducting the sound to yeah. every other room <laughs> even if you do some decoupling of the duct work and all that like just no this isn't the room to put your theater no, in just uh, hang on longer hang and... on keep it where it is and eventually that bedroom right. will be free and then you put the theater in there exactly yeah. uh, a little bit more from daz he has a dolby cinema close by after his past few viewings there he felt his theater at home was awfully close to being just as good hot mm -hmm. diggity i couldn't agree more when i try to go to a theater anywhere <laughs> but for john wick chapter four they ventured out to a dolby cinema that's a little farther away it's a bit bigger and a bit newer everything seemed better than the dolby cinema that he's used to black seemed blacker the bass seemed stronger he knows the Dolby Cinema that's closer to him has bass shakers installed. This other Dolby Cinema seemed to match that impact from the sound alone. He couldn't even tell if it also had bass shakers going. The overall Atmos effect was about on par, but the picture and bass just seemed superior and dialed in better. But he hasn't seen John Wick 4 at his, at his normal Dolby Cinema. He probably will now, just to compare. <laughs> Could it just be the movie itself that made these differences? Or do different Dolby Cinemas deliver different experiences? Maybe it's just the particular calibration, or is it actually the equipment itself? God, theaters one to another are very different. I mean, Dolby Cinema, to be fair, is a little more stringent. because they've got. But a it pretty... will be different. Yeah, it, it can be different. And they have, over the years, uh, you know, up, um, utilized different projector models as things have gone along. They, they haven't just said this is the singular Dolby Cinema projector system that we will ever use. They've, you know, done upgrades. I think they've used both Christie and Barco. Um, they're using like a six DLP chip system. So, you know, not only are there individual DLP chips for the three primary colors, but they're doing the almost like a dual layer LCD. So they've got one series of three DLP chips that is there for contrast, and then a second set of three DLP chips that's there for the color. So it's a six DLP chip system, but I'm pretty sure that there are both uh, Christie and Barco projectors that they use depending on what cinema it's in and there are different sizes of Dolby Cinemas so some have more light output capability than others so this being a little bit bigger a little bit newer uh, I don't know for certain at all but it's entirely possible it actually is a different projection system and maybe this slightly newer one slightly bigger one uh, you know has a little bit updated uh, you know projector um, it, yeah could could easily uh, make up for the difference in that it when it comes like to he was most struck by the sound yeah, and I mean there again. If it's a slightly bigger theater, maybe they spec slightly higher, uh, higher number or a larger size or higher output subwoofers. And yeah, the calibration of it that could be a thing where like just getting it perfectly tuned with the bass shakers that that could just be a, a settings thing where where maybe they just got that dialed in perfectly at the bigger theater and and it's either fallen out of cal calibration or wasn't quite as perfect. Uh, so that you you know like you said, you couldn't even tell is that just the bass or other bass shakers. Dolby Cinemas have bass shakers. I, I don't know of any that don't. Uh, so chances are it did, but like this one you, you couldn't even tell, which is perfect. That's what it's supposed to be. 
It's supposed to be like subtle enough that it feels like all of that tactile movement is just coming from the sound. Mm. Uh, it's supposed to be dialed in like that. So maybe that is purely just a calibration thing. So I gotta, yeah, I got to get to a bigger city sometime yeah. soon and go to some, like <laughs> living out here. We just have a regular old theater. It, yep. It's got a, uh, we've got an IMAX, but yeah. you know, it's not like, the kind of like gigantic dome IMAX. It's yeah, not yeah, even yeah. one of those flat six story IMAX. It's just an yeah. okay IMAX. <laughs> I got to get somewhere that has a real theater for a chance yeah. to try it again. It's been ages. But it, it also is very possible that John Wick for itself has harder, longer bass hits in it than some other movies, sure. right? Oh, you, yeah. you you certainly can't just judge one movie in a theater versus a different movie in a different theater and say the bass I heard is all because of the theater. It right. could just be the movie itself. So he needs to go see it again in the other theater? He needs to go see back. it again. And, yeah, yeah. Let us know. You need to. But yeah, the difference in the image, that, that could be down to, I, I do know they use at least a couple of different projector models. So that mm -hmm. could explain that. Now, a question from Infinite Gary. There uh, must be. You're here. I, I always see an Infinite Gary question, uh, which is great. Uh, if you go from a 55-inch 4K OLED to a 48-inch 4K OLED, are the pixels of the 48-inch display physically smaller? Kind of would have to be. Would them being physically smaller make the 48-inch look sharper than the 55-inch? If you're still sitting the same distance away, maybe... <laughs> that's that's the thing yeah so i mean you know this is just like your uh, computer monitor right yeah, if you're sitting yeah. very close to your computer monitor you keep the resolution the same but you make the monitor size either larger or smaller mm -hmm. then yeah text seems you know if you make the image larger the the display larger but you keep the same resolution then mm -hmm. text doesn't look as crisp and sharp as it does on the smaller display right. so part of that is the pixels themselves necessarily have to be a little bit smaller if it's the same number of pixels in a smaller surface area <laughs> then each pixel is a little bit smaller but also yeah. the gap between each of the pixels there's a limit to how close they can get with a that's given right. technology yep. so that's why you can't just infinitely shrink the same resolution down as yep. much as you want uh but yeah the 48 inch uh, oleds the pixel fill ratio which is the gaps between the pixels mm -hmm. that's all a little bit smaller or the fill ratio is a little bit higher so all the pixels are crammed a little bit closer together mm -hmm. all the pixels are a little bit smaller so if you're Staying at exactly the same distance, something like sharp text will look that little bit sharper on the smaller display. Back in the old CRT days, wasn't that called dot pitch? Yeah, there's that too. It's not exactly the same thing, of Similar. course, but... Well, nothing yeah. ever is between the old CRT days and now. That's but, right. But there you go. Infinite Gary. Question while I'm here. Yes. Uh, <laughs> here we got Greg. Greg set up his home theater about four years ago, putting a bunch of AV rant advice to good use. Excellent. Yay. He went with the darkest of the Sherwin-Williams neutral gray paints, cyberspace. Yeah. And, <laughs> <ooh>. <laughs> and he's got a 7.2.4 speaker configuration using PSB alpha speakers all around, NHT speakers overhead, and a pair of SVS PB1000 subs in diagonally opposite corners. He's got a 135-inch Elune Vision screen up front for his BenQ HD 3550 projector, and it's easy to see why we say any screen larger than that would force your center speaker too close to the floor unless you go acoustically transparent. And we have photos of all this, by the way. Mm -hmm. it is a love I, I love the wood in the middle of all the dark ah, gray yeah. and black. Nice little bit of contrast there. I love that, yeah. Uh, he has a Panasonic UB820 Ultra HD Blu-ray player, but for a while now, he's taken to importing quite a few Blu-rays from the UK. He's in Canada, so his player is set to Region A, and the UK discs are Region B. Some of them play just fine, but some of them don't. So at one point, he remembers Rob saying it can actually be less expensive to just buy a second Region B player rather than buying a region free player from a reseller. That would be fairly easy for him to do. Amazon UK will ship a Region B Blu-ray player to him, no problem. But of course, it will have a UK electrical plug. <laughs> so is there anything else he should be concerned about? Could he just swap the power cable or use a prong adapter? probably or does he need to use an actual power converter and any worries about power conversion this is an interesting one <laughs> <laughs> so for on the last part first for blu-rays i wouldn't be worried about pal conversion at all uh because blu-rays are almost 
almost all 24 frames per second. Uh, yeah. it's, it's pretty rare to get a Blu-ray that isn't 24 frames per second. So uh, that wouldn't even involve anything to do with the 50 hertz that they use in PAL uh, versus the 60 hertz that we use here in North America. Uh, but even if uh, you are like, with the display that you've got, it's compatible with a 50 hertz signal. So there's really no worry about PAL either way as far as uh, sure. connecting that player to your system. Uh, I looked up a couple of the, um, you know, like the like Panasonic's uh, Blu-ray players from the UK um, the, 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 or, or EU ones that use the 220 volt. And they don't mention having a universal power supply. They mention specifically a 220 oh. to 240 volt power supply. Uh, so I would say the safe thing to do here would be to get a 110 to 220 transformer, uh, a 110 to 220 converter. You can get one, like they use 60 watts max, these Blu-ray players. Most of them less than that, but it's 60 watts max. Uh, usually when you're going to a step up transformer like that, so the 110 volt to the one, uh, to the 220 volt, you want to get one that's rated for double the number of watts uh, that the device says it's going to use. So there's a 150 watt converter you can get at home depot in canada for 50 bucks like i okay. think it's worth yeah. just That's i think worth it's it. worth just doing that for the um, convenience you know. of not having to worry about this i'd go 50 bucks for that sure yeah yeah because i mean uh yeah i'm not comfortable with saying yeah just just switch out the power cord because if that's a if that's a 220 volt power supply in there um then it's going to be attempting <laughs> yeah. to, to, you know, draw that out of your wall. That's not going to go well. So I would, I would go ahead and get the, the 110 to 220 converter and they're, they're not crazy overpriced or anything for what right. you need. And, you know, re literally just order it or pick it up from Home Depot. It's probably uh, better than plugging it into your dryer outlet. Yeah. Yeah. So then the other thing I would just mention is like Panasonic's UB820, um, it isn't region free by default. You can get ones that have been modified, hardware modified to be region free, but yeah, they cost more to get the modification than to just buy a second region B player. But mm -hmm. the UBA 20 will play a lot of region B discs with a little workaround, which is as simple as you put the disc in, your region B disc, you put it into your North American UB820. You go through the little, you know, warning menu at the beginning, and it'll pop up a menu that says this, you know, is the wrong region or this only plays in region B players or whatever it is. That that warning will come up on the region B disc. You press stop on the remote. Then you hit top menu, sometimes twice, mm -hmm. and it will like bypass you and dump you into the disc's menu and you oh. can play the disc from there. Oh, okay. Now, it isn't literally every region B disc that that little workaround functions there, okay. there's some that have been authored where they they have no top menu on the disc mm -hmm. so you're not able to do that little workaround but i would be very tempted before ordering uh a player to yeah, of course give that it. a try yeah. on whatever region b discs you own because if you've come across a few where like oh this one won't play pops up the warning that i'm in the wrong region like i would certainly try hitting stop and top menu twice on my remote prior to ordering a whole new player because if that works for what you own that's a pretty easy work it's like a little nintendo cheat code up that's down right right, right a b <laughs> all right let's move on to mike okay uh, Mike's home theater is set up in his basement. Uh, the room is laid out wider than long, so it's about 14 feet long, 16 feet wide, and 8 feet high. His main seats that directly face his 106-inch projection screen are very close to the back wall. So he's about, 50, he's about 13 feet from eyes to screen. Thankfully, he's acoustically treated the back wall behind those seats. Very good idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, we again have pictures of this with his nice chocolatey brown couch That's that looks right. like a nice is a nice warm comfy looking thing all right his front three speakers are m and k lcr 750s they're the original m and k models before they went out of business and then came back as mk sound under different ownership so he's had them for about 20 years now ah see he's after my heart because i have 20 year old speakers <laughs> too and i love it he still thinks they sound good i still think my yamahas sound good mm -hmm. but could it be worthwhile to upgrade i have thought do speakers degrade over time or would simply switching to something like Kef R series or Ascend Sierra Rawl speakers provide a noticeable upgrade to his sound? Uh, speakers can degrade, but I'm here to tell you mine are 23, 22 years old now. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know if they've degraded. Everything sounds great. <laughs> I, I do get like when I run, uh, you know, the routine there to, to change the EQ on them, mm -hmm. uh, I, I get a boost in the high end 
Mm. That a, a fairly substantial ramp up to 16K, but that may have always been like that. But to my ears, my old speakers are kicking right along. They've been kept in an air-conditioned house mm-hmm. uh, or an apartment back in the day for all this time. Uh, so, what? yeah, like what degrades a speaker uh, other than bad conditions, humidity, or yeah. uh, bad manufacturing in the first place? So mechanically, the thing that that would break down on a speaker most obviously most readily if it were anything where if you're um, like the woofers, uh, the mid-range drivers on your speakers, if they use a foam surround, Mm -hmm. so the material that connects the actual driver that moves in and out to the cabinet, there has to be some kind of pliable material in between the driver and where it connects to the cabinet. And some of them, it's a foam. And that foam can just degrade uh, over time. So that is possible. Now, it is... Not that difficult to re-foam a driver. There are re-foaming kits uh, that if you're willing to, you can do yourself. That is definitely something that any speaker repair shop would be able to do. So uh, visually and just like feeling wise, you can tell pretty quickly when the foam starts to degrade because it should be very soft, very squishy, very compliant, easy to move in and out. And when it starts to degrade, it basically gets a little bit brittle. So yeah, yeah. You, you can often see it as little chips in the foam or a little like a crack, like a hairline crack that you can visually see in the foam. Or you can just feel, if you just lightly poke the driver yeah. with your finger, you can just feel that it's not like squishy and easy to move out. It's like kind of brittle now. Yeah. So, or your finger just goes straight through into the speaker. Or, just, or yeah, you just break it. That, <laughs> it just yeah, turns so, to powder at some point. That'll tell you that pretty happen. quick. Yeah. So if the surround is instead like a butyl rubber surround, uh, you basically would have to have straight stored that incorrectly right. in quite harsh conditions. I mean, butyl rubber, of course, can break down. Rubbers right. can break down. Uh, but if you've kept it in the environmental conditions that they always tell you to, you know, that pretty reasonable range of temperatures and not crazy high humidity, then those can last ages and ages and ages. Mm-hmm. So mechanically, that's about all. Now, if the crossovers inside have capacitors, because uh, not every crossover has capacitors. It depends on how it was designed. Uh, mm-hmm. If they do, you know, capacitors like any sort of cell, battery or cell, uh, those can eventually just uh, stop being able to hold the same charge that they used to at one time again that's the sort of thing that any speaker repair shop can easily do for you if you don't want to do it yourself is that would replace obvious right i mean oh uh, well i mean if you played a sweep then it would be pretty obvious you'd be able to tell that something was just not sounding right in that sweep anymore if your crossover wasn't functioning properly anymore that's the crossover between the tweeter and the woofers inside of your speaker so those are about the only things that like degrade on a speaker potentially. Uh, and like I say, it's not very difficult to tell if something's gone wrong. Um, go ahead and play a sweep if you've never played one before. <laughs> but, there you go. You know, yeah. that, that, that'd be about it. So uh, I don't have too many worries with your M and K speakers as to them just having degraded over time and you not noticing it. Um, that, that, I think that's what he was after, right? Right. Um, so, but then his question is, just switching to a different speaker how big of a difference is that going to make compared to what he has his uh older m and k yeah so the m and k 750s like those weren't the flagship you know uh 150 uh studio speakers or something like that these were the smaller meant for home uh i pretty darn sure they were thx select certified uh that 750 series um is it possible to buy speakers today where you would notice a difference in sound Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you could absolutely buy speakers today where you would notice a difference in sound. Are there speakers, in fact, like the ones that you mentioned, if, if you're like looking at the Kef R series or the Ascend Sierra series and goes, I really like the looks of those or I really like, you know, the performance measurements that I've seen out of those. I would go as far as to say that objectively, those are superior speakers to the M&K 750 series. Now, okay. is this going to be some kind of vastly audible <laughs> improvement? I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I would say out of all the things in a sound system that make an appreciable difference to the sound, the room number one, the speakers number two, but even then... I don't really know that speakers make as much of a difference as we like to believe that they do. Uh, I would say, you know, those are the type of thing where in blind listening conditions, unlike two properly functioning amplifiers, I I think that you can reasonably tell speakers apart. Yes. Uh, But like, you know, I always point to the flip side of the Harman blind listening tests where they're like, yeah, in order to reliably tell differences between speakers, it's best to listen to them in mono because that's where you can reliably tell the difference aside. As soon as you go to even stereo and especially surround sound, 
in blind tests, people start having trouble telling apart speakers, <laughs> you know, let alone electronics, which is essentially nobody can ever tell differences as long as they're functioning properly. Right. Like even in speakers, you kind of got to do like mono listening to reliably tell, you know, reasonably okay speakers from each other. Hmm. So I look at the flip side of that as a very beneficial thing, which is like, we don't really need to spend oodles and oodles of money when we've got 11 speakers in our setups. Like the, <laughs> the, the scientific testing indicates that as long as you have anything close to a reasonably good speaker, that reliably telling it from a way more expensive speaker is a difficult proposition. So hmm. I will say, yeah, M&K 750. I think it's possible to improve upon those speakers. I think the two sets of speakers that you mentioned are something where, yeah, even in a blind test, I think you'd be able to tell them apart. I think you'd be able to say that the new ones are better. But do I think you need to do this? That it's going to be some kind of, I have to listen to my entire collection of movies again because I've <laughs> never heard them before this way. I'm like, mm, <laughs> maybe some of your mind from the money you've spent will convince right, you that right. that's the case. But objectively, I think the difference would be reliably noticeable. I don't know that it's going to be transformative to your experience. Mm, and what's the dollar figure on either of those upgrades? Oh, yeah. Those are 1500 to $2,000 per pair type of speakers. Okay. All right. Yeah. But if it's been 20 years... And you just want to have some fun, and you've got the money around, you know? You know yeah. Like, my other car is getting is, is now 20, and it works, but... Yeah. Getting about time to move on. Uh, <laughs> when he originally installed his center speaker, he was worried about his kids or dogs bumping into it if it had been installed below his projection screen. So, he installed the center above the screen instead. <laughs> Makes sense. Yes, he does. isn't worried about the speaker being bumped into anymore. So, would moving the center to below the screen provide any audible benefit? You know what? Try it. <laughs> yeah, that is certainly one Just where you can temporarily, yeah, yeah you, you know, you, it might not be the, uh, the center speaker stand or mount that you permanently use, but you can bring something in there that'll get yeah. it to about the right height and give it a try. I absolutely agree with that advice. Um, would I anticipate it making, again, some kind of gigantic transformative yeah. difference? No, no, those, those M&K... Gigantic one. You know, those M&K 750s had nice, wide, even dispersion. So if you've, if you've angled, I, it's hard to see because his front wall is completely blacked mm. out and the mm. speaker is black. So I can see that the speaker is up there, but I, I can't quite tell if it's been tilted or aimed right, in any right. way. Um, you know, if it has, I wouldn't expect this to be some gigantic difference in sound. But I completely agree with Lee. This is the type of thing you can most certainly test for yourself yeah, good and old see fashioned. if you like it try it you know give mm -hmm. it a go i mean you may if and if, if even if it's placebo if you like it if, <laughs> move it it's great sure this is a zero risk zero dollar if thing, this man. one is yeah this is a zero dollar one yeah give it a go uh in a completely different room his living room he has a 65 inch lg g1 oled mounted on the wall he and his wife really liked the super flush wall mount but now they've moved that tv into the bedroom that's a heck of a bedroom TV. Mm -hmm. He'd like to get another new OLED for the living room. And since they liked the mount so much, he's thinking he'll go with another LG G series model. But the new G3 just came out and the G2 are on clearance. Mm -hmm. Is the G3 significantly better enough to justify the difference in price? We mentioned earlier some differences in the latest yeah. LG OLEDs. Is it enough to justify the difference? Depends what he's going to do. So, yeah, so in years past, like say if this were between a GX and a G1 or a G1 and a G2 or even a GX and a G2, I would have said easily and flatly and quickly, no, go ahead and get the older one because mm -hmm. the difference in performance was tiny. Some mm -hmm. measurable, but tiny. Yeah. The G3s are new. They're all new. They've got a whole new panel going on, oh. and they're the only series in LG's lineup that has it. This is the new micro lens array panel. They are marketing it under the name LG OLED Meta. Oh, no. Which I sigh <laughs> at. I mean, they had LG That's OLED an eye Evo, roller. right? Evo was where they started, uh, but now, now they're on to, on to Meta, which. Oh boy. Anyway, does it, does it automatically bring Facebook up on the screen? <laughs> no, thankfully, no. I don't know why they chose that name. But anyway, 
What's at play here is this new micro lens array panel, and only the G3 series has it mm. in LG's lineup. Mm. Uh, Panasonic is using it in their flagship series, but that's only over in Europe. And oh. uh, Philips is using it in their flagship series, but only over in Europe. Okay. So in North America, LG's G3 series is the only place to get a micro lens array OLED this year, and it is brand new. And look, I haven't seen one yet. I haven't even said seen measurements that are like you know full bore measurements but vincent Tio got a preview of it i trust his measurements implicitly mm -hmm. he didn't have as much time to spend with it as he's going to on his full review when he, he posted the initial first look video but he did get to measure one of these micro lens array displays and it is the real deal it is making a significant difference uh and in a couple of beneficial ways that i didn't even expect i was thinking that anything that involves micro lensing in mm -hmm. front of the pixels would mean that the viewing angles got narrower because i would, would just think. expect yeah you would think but it's the opposite they actually got even wider like even on the original LG OLEDs, which How had, do you get wider? <laughs> I know, really excellent wide angle viewing, yeah. but there was the slightest bit of color tinging, like a mm. little bit of color shift when you're mm. far off axis. Mm -hmm. With the micro lens arrays, it's like you can basically get to like 179 degrees off axis and Jeez, the color okay. hasn't shifted at all. It's just all right. crazy. So even on that front, it, it I wasn't expecting it to take a step forward at all, but it did. Oh. And then like they really are brighter. Like, unquestionably so. They really are brighter. So that's really the question, though. Do you want your LG OLED to be even brighter than the one that you had in the living room? Because that's what the G3 is giving you. It's even brighter, and the viewing angles are even wider. Um, but it's a real difference. It's not like going from the G1 to the G2, where I was like, meh. You know, absolutely go get right. the G1 at a, at a cheaper price. Don't worry about the G2. From the G2 to the G3, it's it's a it's an entirely new panel, that, that micro lens array panel. It's a, it's a wholly different display. Well, like, not underlying display technology, but a, a wholly different screen uh, going on with that G3. So I can't say it's an easy, don't bother <laughs> getting the new one time. Yeah. Like this one, it, there's a real difference going on. I, I um, feel like he probably should. This seems like he might appreciate it and he's not buying a, a bunch of TVs every year. Exactly. He's yeah. got a new jump in in yeah. quality. So, yeah. and he likes that G series. So yeah. it seems like that's, that's his, that's yeah, his this, TV. This is one where I could say, oh, it actually is maybe worth it to to pay the higher yeah. price this time. Uh, normally, that hasn't been my answer historically, but this time there's a there's a real thing going on. All right, there so you I go. think we're we spending shall... someone's money. Yes. Yeah, we shall end it there. I'm I'm about oh. done. So uh, Wait, yeah, you're we're... ending it. What? Oh Not yeah, me? I mean. Yeah, Tom. Tom's gonna have a fit as it is. So there we go. I will say Eric and Bob are on the list for next week. They aren't tremendously long questions, but we'll okay. we'll have you saved to start off next week's episode. So there we go. Uh, I think I'll scroll back up to the top here to uh, thank our listeners of the week, uh, people who supported the podcast in some way. So uh, Patreon.com/slash AVRant Podcast is one way to do that with an automatic monthly donation. We have 139 people who have signed up to be patrons of ours over there. So thank Thank you very much for the financial support. And David uh, sent us a whole bunch of movie codes, you know, I mean, to check out, make sure that the type check. of thing that would work, to let yeah. them know. But we, we appreciate verify. that. That's, yeah. that's yeah. Very, very nice of you, David. So thank you for that. Uh, and then, yeah, some people have sent us notes of gratitude just for keeping the podcast going through thick and thin. We appreciate those notes of encouragement. So Andreas, Greg, and Bob, thank you very much for sending those. And a big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. Lee, why don't you tell people where they can send those questions if they want them answered on this year podcast uh, a question at avrant.com that is the place that's, that's our email address question at avrant.com send your questions there so there we go uh, i will say yeah on behalf of tom andrew who hopefully he and i will be back together next week but who knows what schedules will say so uh that's that's the plan but uh yeah well maybe we'll see both hosts back here next week so Probably. on behalf of him uh and for av rant i am rob h and i'm lee overstreet now go out and listen to something Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com.
This is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.